and we're let's live. Do it. Okay. Hello. Hello. No cold open. We're getting right into it. <laughs> yes. No, d no dog right. because I I was an idiot and I was late. All right, I'm Johnny. He's Kyle. This is our show, Gallard's Guide to Werewolves. We're doing the Silent Striders. Yes. Sentence. Last episode, we talked about the Ministry, and you age restricted that video because of how graphic we got with it. Well, yeah, I was like, it just talking about that. I uh, I didn't have to do that for the Black Spiral Dancers, which is weird. <laughs> Because, like, the Black Spiral Dancers are just as evil, but, like, uh, the Ministry is, hey. is evil in a more, like, age-restricted way. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah, you... The Black Spirals out and out kill you. You wish death would come quickly with the Ministry. Yep, yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you see in history pages... I posted the Sot Strider trap book picture, but put up the picture beneath that first. Uh, in history chat? Yes. Uh, put the... Wait, the... the yeah. Yeah. yeah, the dude looks scary as hell. Ah, okay. And... Let's see it. Hmm. So this is something that's just not brought up in the Silent Striders book at all. And I'm supposing if people did learn about this, they would all turn on the Silent Striders. So what we are looking at right now is the Ravnos Antediluvian Zapathashura, formerly known as Ravana. This dude came from the Silent Striders. Really? Yes. Uh, the, the exact story as to how he became... Uh, an antediluvian is up in the air. We don't know if one of Cain's kids or Cain himself or someone else sired him. But what's absolutely cool about this clan is that their history is tied with so many vampire clans. The first one they're tied with is the Ravnos clan. The Ravnos have always been the least interesting vampire clan to me. Because... They're just the Bruja by a different name. I mean, their clan compulsion and curses that they have to get involved in crime in some sort of way. And that's just not interesting. I mean, the Bruja already do that. The, uh, all vampires already do that. Because this game is about conspiracy theories and underground criminal networks. So a clan that's just forced into being a criminal just isn't interesting. It's not fun. But... The whole Wicked Nightmares scenario and learning more about their Antediluvian has fixed my gripes about the Raphnos. I think them having the Doomed um, curse is a better idea. That's the one thing I'll say that Vampire 5e did right. And everything about this guy. Keep Ravana in the back of your minds for this episode. Because we are going to start with history. All right. Oh, turning this song off. Uh, we had to get a new music bot because Jockey Music went tits up. Yeah, it tends to happen a lot. It, it already started to suck when they wouldn't let you do YouTube music anymore. Yeah. Oh, it's copyright's a bitch. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of it. You, okay, history you time. Ha you have been looking into the Silent Striders, and you have told me that these guys have grown on you more than the Wendigo. Tremendously. Yeah, you went into this game not liking anything about the Wendigo. And now you've turned around and you kind of like the Wendigo. You had no formal opinion of the Silent Striders. And your opinion has completely changed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, said, you told me before this episode... The next time we play Werewolf, you want to be this clan. Yes, I've done. I haven't done much in the reading on the history, but just like when it comes to their camps, how they operate, what they do, I absolutely love what they do. Like being being the sneaky bastard always appeals to me. For even though I'm terrible at stealth most of the time, yeah. not just that, but like all the ways that they that they like to keep ancient knowledge similar to the, how the Fianna did. And it turns out them and the Fianna are actually great friends in the lore. And we'll get into that later, but I, yeah. but between, between how their camps operate and their gifts and their rights, they're absolutely incredible. 
I I love the Silent Striders. <laughs> uh, these these guys are fucking awesome. I've never I've had one person I've seen, and in the attempt I in the game I attempted to run in the Rage Across the Internet server, there was one guy who was based as hell, who was playing a Silent Strider, and he sent me this three uh, this three page backstory where he thought of everything. As this was the one character I thought was awesome out out of that group. I mean, we had a Glasswalker who was okay, and all the other players just sucked, but this guy, as I was looking at it, this was a guy who knew his his werewolf stuff, who knew World of Darkness as a whole, and this is the best player I've I've had besides you guys. Yeah. We're thankful, uh, he, we're thankful the, that, we're, that we're up there. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't... He wasn't good enough for me to stand up server, absolutely not. Um, yeah. And we'll... Um, well, we'll, well, we can shit talk Ridge across the internet. Some other day. <laughs> we could, but another thing I wanted to say is that you'll, we'll get into this later, but once you hear the history, you could say whatever you want about how badass the Wendigo are, how badass the Get Ephemeris are. The Silent Striders need to go see a chiropractor for how much their back is crooked from carrying the Garo. And also, uh, I don't know what Dick, Dick Doctor is called up for fucking all the, all the vampires all day. Um, not a, not a, is it a proctologist? Uh, well, no, it's a penis doctor. I don't know the name for it. And all on it, it off top. So history, let's get into history. I, uh, I'm going to use this, uh, start as a, as a moment to tell Ryan and Amelin of Werewolf Den to eat a dick for a second. Cause they say in their video, quote, the first page, first paragraph of the Silent Strider book is racist, and therefore the entire book as a whole is racist because it's filled with racist content. I'm going to read this to you verbatim. So, first paragraph in this book. You ready? Good. Maybe you were told the tale by a trucker who recognized you for what you were. Maybe it was a mentor speaking to you around the time when your pack of cubs needed to learn the tribe's history. Maybe you're one of the few fortunates who can hear the voices of our lost ancestors. Regardless, the story probably went something like this. Every Garu who knows who we are, the Silent Striders are Wanderers. But any group of Wanderers is really split into two groups. Those who wander by choice, and those who wander because they have no home to return to. I could tell you that... What the percentage split is amongst our tribe. It doesn't really matter. We have both kinds. In fact, to some degree, every strider is both kinds. We don't have a home to return to anymore, and we're bred with loners, outcasts, travelers, and wanderers for so long that the road is in our blood. Was any of that racist? Absolutely. Not that I can think of. I think it's what they yeah, what go- caught their eye was like what some trucker told you, and they're like, "Oh, truckers are public." Some mental gymnastics. None of that was uh, racist. You're you're being charitable about this. I'm calling Amelin and Ryan out and out liars. I don't care if that puts me at risk of libel. That's what you are. You're liars. Yeah, I mean, we'll, no, we'll get more into that when we talk about the sound shredders. Yeah, yeah. No, well, no, not the sound shredders. The stargazers. Is- both of you phoned in that episode, and I can't wait to talk about the Stargazers, but we're not doing it this month. We're going to do it in August. A little bit away from today. Yeah. Sue me if you want. Fuck you. I don't care. What, are you going to get all $500 left in my bank account? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Now we begin the history. So, ancient times, this is one of the few werewolf tribes that forms in the Middle East. This tribe and the Glasswalkers and the Children of Gaia all form in this area. Uh, the Children of Gaia are a little bit north, like in the middle area between Greece and the Middle East. And the Glasswalkers, when they were called the Warders of Apes, uh, yeah, thank you. I feel very recognized by you calling me that. They do call us that a, a lot in the book, in all honesty. And the Silent Striders formed in the Arabian Peninsula. And in ancient times, before any nation really formed, because of how Arabic culture has worked for years and years before Islam was invented, these guys were nomads. We're going to go where the water is, we're going to go where the food is, and we're just going to hang out and we're going to spread across the entire continent. These guys spread themselves across everywhere. 
Africa, Europe, Asia, they went everywhere. This includes India, which explains why they have their connection to Ravana, the Ravnos Antediluvian. These guys went to India, and India wasn't their home. They do have a few places they can call Cairns in India, but not many. And this is where Ravana would eventually split from the tribe and become the Ravnos Antediluvian. But we'll talk about that later. We we may we might do an episode of the Ravnos. I don't know. I don't know. I I've never found the Ravnos lore to be that interesting. We may or may not do that episode. We'll see. Uh, what happens in real history of uh, the Impergium? Yes. So, all the tribes we've talked about, the White Hellers were the one group that was on board with the Impergium. The Fianna and Wendigo were... Well, the Wendigo didn't care. The Fianna were against it. Take a guess. Were the Silent Striders for or against the Impergium? They were for it in the start of it, yeah. Mm hmm but they stopped, and you know why? Because they realized that hey, we're sp a we're supposed to protect the Earth from Mother by by order of Mother Gaia putting us here, and also the humans that do survive will be will have a serious vendetta against the werewolves. Yeah, we're only killing the weak humans. The strong humans are going to survive, and they're going to fuck us on the ass when they learn what we're doing. When they learn where our bases are. This is a really stupid idea. We're going to piss off the wrong enemy. We got to stop. I don't care if the worm is talking to these guys. We need to stand our ground and fight these guys. <clears throat> and by fight these guys, I mean completely withdraw from the fight and then, no, try to integrate with them. You can't beat them, join them. <laughs> so they didn't really lobby as much as the Children of Gaia and the Fianna did. Uh, the, the Silent Striders went to three different kings to try to appeal the court uh, reason for ending the Impergium. And they weren't taken seriously. It was the combined effort of the Children of Gaia and Fianna that stopped the Impergium. Uh, the Silent Striders feel like they're being snubbed from some credit. They feel like they, feel like they should have been given some credit for stopping the Impergium. But, you know, you're the Silent Striders. You're your history is to be the unsung hero before you even named yourself as a tribe. Yep. Uh, what happened next? War of Rage. So I told you what the real reason for starting the War of Rage was. Yes. And it's I... been a while since I've told you that reason. Do you remember? Yes, it is, it is blanking in my mind right now, sadly. The guys they were after in the War of Rage were the Ananasi. It is because the Ananasi killed the most wild of the changing breed, the were insects. These being dragonflies, ants, locust, bees. The Ananasi killed all of them. And the werewolves realized that we need to stick it to the weaver before the weaver becomes a serious threat. So they formed a plan to attack the Ananasi. The Korax squealed on them, told all the other changing breeds, and with the Macaulay leading the charge, a massive war between the werewolves and every other changing breed broke out. And they quickly lost sight of the real target and went after the Macaulay instead. These were the guys who were fighting the Macaulay. If you remember what that is, that is the were crocodile. Or were lizard, were dinosaur. They kind of take the shape of whatever reptile they feel like taking the shape of. And the Sonic Striders because, you know, it's the Nile River, it's Egypt, there's crocs everywhere. These were the guys who were getting face-to-face -face with the Macaulay and fighting them. And they did a pretty good job. You go to 1v1, a silent strider, and before they got their crazy death gifts, they were already kicking the asses of the Macaulay, which is kind of em embarrassing because the Macaulay can just turn themselves into dragons, or the closest alternative there is to dragons, and they still lost. They would have pushed the Macaulay to extinction, but by that point, the Imperium was called off by the Silver Fangs, and they're looking at the Silver Fangs saying, what are you talking about? We've got these guys on the ropes. Why are we stopping? But, uh, you're the boss. I guess we're done. So with the War of Rage done, the Sonic Striders look at the Nile River and say, 
this is a pretty cool sp spot. Let's make this our home. They looked at what was in Egypt. By this time, it was called Kemet. And they decided to make this their homeland. Sure, they had a sound strider everywhere. But they did a... They decided they were going to make this their home base. That Egypt is going to be our homeland. We've claimed it. We've called dibs on Egypt. Nobody else gets Egypt. This is going to be our space. There were bone knowers and glass walkers around this time. But they didn't have a majority in Egypt. The Silent Striders were the majority in Egypt. And you have the Bubasti. The Bubasti, the Egyptian werecats. And you, the Bubasti don't really contribute anything. I mean, just throughout Giru history, they haven't contributed anything. Even before the curse was set, the Bubasti just didn't really get involved in anything. So those are our neighbors. Fine. We've got a few Macaulay, but they know not to mess with us. Fine. And life is pretty good. Except for one issue. Who's that issue? Uh, that would be the, uh, that would be a worm cult in the Shadowlands. Yep. That would be a worm cult that formed in the Shadowlands. A worm figured out that the Shadowlands are a pretty cool spot to make a cult. <clears throat> Nobody's going to think to look for us here. We're going to sit in the Shadowlands and we're going to start raising the dead. This isn't the same kind of magic that Ra had. Ra was... Well, we, we theorized that Ra was a wormish mage because he mentions the Demiurge by name. And the Demiurge, in this case, being the worm. So, this is a different sect. These aren't guys who follow Ra. These are guys who realize that there's money to be made and conquest to be made in making zombies. And the Silent Striders start fighting these guys. Then, oh no, Set shows up and starts causing trouble. Well, now we gotta fight Set. And then, oh no, the Euthanatos have showed up. And we gotta keep an eye on the Euthanatos. We don't know about these guys. And then the Egyptians learn how to make mummies. And then mummies start showing up. And sometimes the mummy is good. Sometimes the mummy is bad. Most of the time, the mummy is bad. So we've got four different issues that we keep jumping between. And we got to figure out which one we're going to prioritize. They get rid of the Shadowland cult first. Because that's easy enough. They figure out how to get into the Shadowlands through Owl. Let's talk about Owl. Yes, the Owl totem. Yeah. So there's not that much information regarding Owl in this book. Owl's pretty enigmatic. This guy just hangs around the Shadowlands. He hangs around the deep, dark Umbra where very few people can go to and survive. I mean, even mages have a hell of a time in the, in the Dark Umbra. And Owl is this demigod of death. Not so much causing death, but just death as a natural part of the world. He's not... He's not exactly good death. He's not bad death. He's just death. Kind of what the Balance Worm used to be before the Triadic Worm took over. And I don't want to say Owl is wormish in nature, but this is as close to a good worm totem as you can get. A and neutral Owl's, one. Um, what? A neutral one. Yeah, he's, he's kind of neutral. Just the neutral aspects of death. And his breed is kind of creepy too. He's got the Twice Born, who are these rodents that he'll pick the skin off of and the muscle off of and then spit the skeleton out and the skeleton will still be alive and Owl will look at that rodent and say, hey, you serve me now. And he'll also have the death's breath. You encountered one of these in Vampire. Uh, when was that? Remind me. That was a very early session too. That was when we had Dentise in the party and one of them snuck up behind him and sank his teeth into him while he was in a van. Oh, yeah, that's right. It, he snuck into his van and then tried to eat him. Yeah, that was a very deadly... We, we had a Silent Strider appear in our vampire game, and that was a very deadly encounter. Colt almost lost his character. I almost <laughs> got one-shotted. I was in Torpor. And then you stole that scythe, and then you never learned how to use it. We, we didn't. We really didn't. <laughs> he was just like, oh, I have a scythe. I'm going to hit people with it. The, the Death's Breath 
is this living cloud of chlorine gas before chlorine gas was weaponized that will fly around and it will steal the breath from people and just kill them. But they're very lonely. The minute you find one, it will immediately serve you because you're the first living person it has seen in decades. It, it, it's kind of funny. They're like, you remember that old 2012 12 Forever Alone meme? Yeah, that's basically what a death's breath is. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. They're, they're very lonesome, but very dangerous. And there's also a segment in here that says, uh, for more information on the Silent Striders, read Rage Across Egypt. And I read Rage Across Egypt, and that book is the biggest nothing burger I've ever read in my life, dude. I, it, that is the worst World of Darkness supplement. I mean, I was looking through that book, and not only was there no addition to the lore besides screwing over the Bubasti, just preventing them from ever being interesting... But that was the worst artwork in the series, dude. <laughs> I mean, is it really? I, I posted up one picture in deranged chat. Don't put up on the screen. There's nipples in it. Oh, oh okay. Um, Never mind. I will look at it. Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The entire book looks like that, dude. <laughs> it, well, no, it hasn't. Okay, yeah, I see what you're talking about. That is really odd. So, chat. So, you know what I'm looking at is like this guy. That's like seven feet tall, and he looks like he looks like if Marlon Brando tried to work out at seventy is what it looks like with a werewolf head, <laughs> and he's holding one of those like curved blades, and beneath him there's like this fo this five foot tall woman with it, and she looks like she smoked three packs a day. W what's odd about her is like she has breasts, she has her breasts out, and she has like this weird sloping stomach, like. Like it was, I, I I don't even know how to describe it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to make uh, everybody watching this lose their lunch. But it's anyway it, it's hey, rough. it's it's incredible just how the world of darkness all their books keep swapping back and forth between amazing and terrible. There's yeah. no middle ground. It's either really good or really really bad. <laughs> Yeah, like Freak Legion. I read that one. Freak Legion's artwork was horrific, but it was awesome. Yeah, it it's not that it wasn't the best pictures, but given what they were depicting, um, it might be to our benefit that it wasn't drawn by a better artist. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, where were we? Yeah. Isis. Yes. So after getting rid of that worm cult. These guys are approached by Isis, and we've detailed most of the story of Set in our ministry video. That is a huge lore dump. If you want to learn about what was going on with Set, watch that video. So Isis comes in. Let me, let me post a picture of her in, in history pages, have you put it up on the screen. We'll be using the smite depiction of her. There she is. All right. All right. The reason why this isn't in the Silent Striders book is because Mummy wasn't written yet. Mummy retconned a whole bunch of stuff. So we're taking a minute to get off of the Silent Striders 2nd edition, which is what we've got most of our lore from, and we're reading from Mummy for a moment. So those wizards I mentioned before that the Silent Striders had to keep an eye on, the Euthanatos wasn't organized in this part of the world yet. They were still called the Chakravanti, and they were still deciding what they want, wanted to be in Africa and Europe. But given how much Greece, Macedonia, and Egypt talked back in the day, it's no stretch of the imagination that Euthanatos magic ended up in Egypt back when it was commit. Isis got her magic from a guy called Thoth, and Thoth, it's kind of up in the air as to who he was. No, the Euthanatos don't claim him as a member. But given that he taught Isis magic involving death and necromancy and revival, he kind of, if I was to place that in a tradition of magic, that's Euthanatos magic. But given that he's Thoth, it could have been hermetic magic. And the Euthanatos mages don't exactly claim Isis either. So it's kind of up in the air. She's by classification a marauder mage. 
uh, her magic is close enough to the Euthantos that I'm I'm going to refer to her as a Euthantos mage. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So she approaches the Silent Shredders, and the Silent Shredders are keeping an eye on her, saying, what's going on with this lady? Is she trustworthy? She's got that same kind of look to her as all the other wizards. We were kind of cool with them until they started raising the dead like that worm cult was doing. And necromancy is a big taboo across the Garo Nation. We went to war with the girl because of it. We don't know what to think of her, so they're getting ready to attack Isis. And then Isis says, I hear you've been having trouble with the cult of Set. And the Silent Striders pause. Set has been a pretty big thorn in her side. Set wasn't going after the Silent Striders sp specifically, but the Ministry was a growing problem in the Giru Nation. So Isis comes to, them, comes to them, and she has a plan. She says, I've got a whole bunch of other people lined up to help us. I've got the last of the Apis. I've got a few Puka with us. I've got my husband that I raised from the dead and may or may not have some La Sombra blood in him. You guys don't know who the La Sombra are. Good. Because if you did, you'd probably turn against me. <laughs> Would you like to help us fight Set? And the Sun Shredders think it over and they say, we're thinking about it, but tell us a little bit more. What's in it for you? Isis says, it's my son. And that draws the attention of the Silent Striders. The family unit is important within every werewolf family. It's not just the Fianna, it's not just the Wendigo, it's every werewolf values family. Yeah, so ancestral connection is, is lethally important to all Garo. It, it is lethally important. The Silent Striders listen to the story of Isis, and Horus draws their attention. And they're so moved by Horus's plight that one of the Geru steps up and changes his name to be Shu Horus. In order to prevent confusion, we're going to call him Shu Heru for the story. And, well, he does have an official portrait, but we made an AI picture for him. Here he is. Put him up on the screen. I already got it. So, he walks up to Isis, and he says, I will personally follow you into Set's lair, and I'll help you get your son back. So, the Silent Striders have the back of Isis. And, of course, we detailed the entire story. Isis goes in. Osiris leads the charge. Osiris distracts Set while Isis met... met it's so hard to pronounce her name. Mets the and Shu, Hor Shu Heru go and get the body of Horus. They do the spell. Horus is brought back as a mummy, but we are out of time. Set has killed Osiris, and now he's here. So Shu Heru starts fending him off. So does Isis. And it's just not enough. Metztha is trying her best, but still not enough. Horus stands up. He stops being a paralyzed, stiff corpse and putting his entire soul behind one attack damages Set so hard that it permanently removes his cock and balls. You remember me telling you that? Yes, from last episode. So while Isis and Metztha scoop up the body of Horus and run, and Set looks at his human form and realizes that his cock and balls are gone, Shu, Hor Shu Haru and the rest of the Silent Shredders stick around and finish the job. Shu Haru has a secret weapon that he developed with Owl. It is a gift that will clog the blood of a vampire, and it works on antediluvians. We'll get into that later. That is a, that big edge, because there goes your Serpentis, there goes your Presence, there goes your Obfuscate. You can't protect yourself from this attack, you can't disappear before we attack you, you can't convince us or scare us to not attack you, and Shu Haru lands the blow that puts Set in torpor. Now there is a bit of a weird moment in this story because they brought him in torpor and we detailed in the Ministry episode that they were trying to stab him in the heart and cut his head off and his skin was just too thick for their blades to penetrate. 
Why didn't they take him out into the sun? Well, they probably did, and it didn't kill him. I mean, we detailed the week of nightmares. Ravana was out in the sun for three days, and it didn't kill him. His body was on fire, and it still wasn't killing him. The nukes weren't killing him. It took a technocracy laser to kill him. On top of the sunlight, on top of the nukes. So, putting Set out in the sun, that wasn't, that wasn't going to kill him. I mean, it was going to set him on fire, and maybe you could let him barbecue forever, but eventually a Setite is going to pick up his body, run away with it, and then try to revive it. So, this, the Silent Striders decided, we're going to break even. We're just going to take his body, seal it in a coffin, put it at the bottom of this dangerous tomb, and leave it there, and that's really all we can do with it. And then what happens a year later? A uh, year later. Set's curse. The curse. The curse. Yes. Exactly, the curse. So, Set planned in advance. He decided through a series of curses that I am going to place a little curse on everyone who was involved in my death. Well, not, not really his death. I mean, Set is in Torpor, but, you know, we haven't seen Set in years. His we downfall. haven't seen him in millennia. He might as well be dead. And the Silent Shredders eat the biggest dick out of all of them. It's a curse that affects them in three ways. One, they can no longer regain Gnosis while in Egypt. Two, the ancestor spirits are permanently gone. They just can't talk to them anymore. Three, rates. So, them stepping in the Shadowlands, the Wraiths took notice of that. They said, we just saw those guys leave the Shadowlands. There's something going on with those wolves. And once that cur curse took effect, it was a beacon. A, every Silent Strider is a lighthouse to every Wraith. And a Wraith will just immediately start coming to them. And will just throw their arms around that Silent Strider and say, Oh, I'm dead, and I can't pass on. Please help me with my problems. And the Silent Strider say, I don't want to help you. I've got my own issues to worry about. And then more and more and more rates just piled on top of that. And the Silent Strider said, This is impossible. We, we can't do this. We need to leave Egypt. And it sucked. I mean, that, that hurts. I mean... It's the feeling of your house burning down. It, that, that's the feeling that Sonic Strutters had. And knowing that the house was never going to be rebuilt. But don't cry too much for the Sonic Strutters. They end up going to Morocco, India, uh, the southern parts of Europe. They're, they're fine. And their cairns were quickly scooped up by the Bubasti and the not-quite-Euthanatos. The, the worm did get a few, but... Yeah, don't worry too much about that. They would eventually be pushed out. And so stuff kind of sucks for the Silent Striders for a couple of years, right? Yes. I mean, losing your ancestors, losing access to Shu Heru, the guy who put Set into Torpor, there goes your guide for putting any, any Antiluvian in Torpor. I mean... That guy might as well have just written the list of steps to take to kill Antiluvian um, Solot, for example, even though you don't want to do that, Solot's a pretty good guy. The list of just the requirements you would need to stop Gehenna, that's gone. Set screwed you over. I mean, that that's a pretty damn dangerous curse, and kudos to Set to figuring that out. Yeah, I don't know how, but he did know, he did take that step. Probably, it, it's probably because he had Malkav with him. More than likely, yeah. And Malkav saw the future at all times. And and because Malkav knew what was going to happen, he didn't come to Set's aid during that time. If they were fighting Set and Malkav at the same time, that would have been a loss. Yeah, it definitely would have. But then that's... Set kind of fucked up by trying to kill Malkav's sister. Yeah, well... Oh, in our games, they don't really like each other that much. I'm pretty sure Malkov will get ready to forget and forgive about that. Yeah. She formed the Camarilla f fucker. I don't care about her anymore. <laughs> Something that's really cool about the Silent Striders 
that I haven't seen anyone talk about is that these guys witnessed Jesus Christ and Muhammad during their lives. These guys have seen it all, by the way. Just name any historical event. A silent Strider was there to see it. And they detail being around Christ. Uh, Yeshua Bar Joseph. There were silent Striders among the 12 disciples that were following Jesus around from place to place, watching the miracles. They saw him turn the water into wine. They saw him calm the storm from a distance. They saw him raise himself from the dead. They, they heard about Jesus reviving. And they said, that's impossible. And then they checked him out. And sure enough, he had the stigmata, and he was alive, talking to the Twelve. And the Sot Striders have no idea what to make of it. The dude wasn't a mage. They, I, I mean, a Sot Strider more than likely came to Jesus and asked him about magic, and then Jesus just didn't have an answer for it. And whenever Jesus moved through a moon bridge, the moon bridge would be disconnected. They would have to go through the right all over again to reestablish the moon bridge connection. And every worm spirit refused to come near Jesus. They were in the Umbra, and they saw that around Jesus, there would not be a single bane. And that kind of recontextualizes the, the passion when you look at Christ and World of Darkness. Because there was no worm involved. That was all human. The Pharisees and the Romans killing Jesus, that was all human. And of course, the crucifixion of Jesus ended up breaking Set out of Torpor, but we haven't seen Set in 2,000 years. This is probably bullshit. I mean, if Set's out of Torpor, then why haven't we seen him, dude? Uh, well, probably Who's because he right? can't freaking get out of that tomb. His heart's probably they still the, stopped by the discipline. They used the good nails. Yeah, they did. They they got DeWalt. I also saw Muhammad during his years, and they detailed that, yeah, Muhammad didn't set a successor, and he probably... <clears throat> my, my belch cut me off. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Didn't set a successor? Yeah, my, yeah, my throat inflated like a frog for a second. <laughs> when that happens. So they detail that, yeah, there's the split between the, the Sunnis and the Shiites. And they say it's probable that Muhammad could have seen Angel Gabriel because, you know, we get, get visions from Gaia all the time. It's entirely likely that an angel came down from heaven and came to this guy and said, this is my law, do as I say, I am the voice of God. They, they say it's, it's more than likely that Islam has some validity to it. But there's something interesting along with that the same day that muhammad got his vision there was a silent strider called firewalker who had a little vision where he saw an angel made out of fire appear in the sky and then nosedive right into the planet and then set the entire planet on fire on impact he's seen the rapture that's why he's seen he's seen the rapture before it happens he he hasn't read the book of revelation but the detail of Wormwood crush, crush, crashing into the planet and causing the first half of the revelation, he's seeing that in that vision. But what's really sad about that, he doesn't see the second half. Have you read the book of Revelation, dude? I, I have not. I've heard pieces of it, but I haven't sat down and read it. The first half of that book is scary as hell. That is a cosmic horror story before, like, 2,000 years before Lovecraft was made. Uh, before Lovecraft was made. Before Lovecraft, Lovecraft was born. born. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was made by his mother and father in the womb. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the second half of Revelation, dude, that is probably the most beautiful ancient literature you can ever read. The description of heaven in that book. I have a King James Bible around here somewhere. I think it's in my drawer. Right here. Like, you, you can check out the book of Revelation after we do this episode, but yep. yeah, it goes from being terrifying to being tear jerkingly beautiful. You know what they it, say? It, you, it's gotta, amazing to... you gotta go through hell before you get to heaven. Yeah, the whiplash you get from reading Revelation. But Firewalker doesn't see that. He only sees the first half. And Firewalker gets so damn depressed from what he sees that he kills himself. I mean, like, shortly after he got that vision, he commits suicide. Jesus. And, 
And it, it's kind of a bad precedent because does that kind of entail that no werewolf goes to heaven when they die? That when the world of darkness ends, that none of them will ever go to heaven, none of them will go to hell, they'll just cease to exist? Is that what that entails? It, it I mean, it's entirely possible, but there is there is a way, evidently, to become one with uh, to become one with Gaia because uh, what was the antiluvium for for Gangrel? Anoya. Yeah, because Anoya managed to become one with Gaia. And I believe that's as close to heaven as werewolves could possibly get. You're going to have to crush your fingers and hope that God never follows through with the revelation. Well, um, it's going to be extremely painful for a couple of pages. It is going to be. And then nothing after that. Uh, so, after Islam. The step. The Sonic Shredders go to Mongolia and Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan and all the Istans, and they start rubbing shoulder shoulders with the Shadow Lords. And they immediately see through the Shadow Lords bullshit. They know that these guys are up to something. Uh, picture this. A Silent Strider and a Shadow Lord are sitting at a bar, and on top of the bar, they're both holding beers or whatever drink they order, and they're laughing and they're having a good time. And then beneath the bar, they're both pointing pistols at each other's nuts. So, yeah, that scene from Inglorious Bastards. It's exactly. That's, that perfectly sums up the relationship between the Silent Striders and the Shadow Lords. The Silent Striders know the Shadow Lords are up to something. The Shadow Lords know the Silent Striders know that they are onto something. But they're not going to say anything. Because if they do, mutually assured destruction. Yeah, that's that's one thing I noticed in the book is that the Silent Striders are a very inquisitive and observant bunch, and they will find most people suspicious. These guys are geniuses. I mean, th these guys max out their wisdom stat and insight stat. Yeah, when when we get to when we get to reading camps, you'll know what I'm you'll know what I'm talking about. The Dark Ages roll around, and yeah, yeah, we're, it sounds like we're skipping a lot of time. It's because there's a lot of history in here. And we do encourage on checking out the book for yourselves and reading the book for yourselves. So we're, we're giving you kind of like a fast-forwarded version. We're detailing the stuff we find really interesting. Yep, a cursory, a cursory glance at the history of the Silent Striders. <laughs> so these guys form a few cairns in Egypt along with side uh, Shadow Lords. And majority of them are Shadow Lord cairns. The, sh the Silent Striders will just pay them a visit every now and then to regain some Gnosis. Then comes the Dark Ages and this fetishistic fascination with Egyptian folklore and mysticism and the Romani people. The Silent Striders are 50% of the Romani. The other 50% are the Ravnos and anyone connected to the Ravnos. There's that horrible, stupid book. Which one? There's that stupid, there's that stupid book, World of Darkness Gypsies. I think I told you about that. I don't think you have, actually. Right, so it's this really stupid book where they just portray the entirety of the Romani people as just a magical race that's inherently magical because they're half Egyptian, half Eastern European, and they just have all these magical powers unique to themselves, and it's just really stupid. It's like it doesn't tie into the lore at all. It doesn't. It's just, it's so out of place. It's like, why the fuck did you write this? Like, as somebody who watched all of Peaky Blinders, like, you gotta do better than that. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that whole fascination, and the Sonic Shredders say, eh, fuck it, let's roll with it. They start getting a little bit of influence. They start forming a few bases for themselves. They have to share them with some other Sonic Shredders. Uh, Werewolf tribes, namely the Warders of Men. Oh, they changed their name. Hmm. All in the Bonars. Well, then the Bonars quickly kick them out because Owl and Rat don't get along. So they settle with the Children of Gaia. The occasional Black Fury will take them in. It's kind of like your friend who will just crash on your couch for a few days and then head off to his other friend's house and then crash on his couch. It, they're, they're, they're just constant crowd, uh, couch crashers. Basically. You, you can think of the sound stress as that. They come over and say, hey, you got some Gnosis, and then they'll stay at your house for a few days, and then yeah. once they get their Gnosis, they leave. It's like the like the Fianna have the wandering rovers. Imagine that, but it's the entire tribe. Mm-hmm. 
My entire tribe does this. And fortune telling. Owl as a totem will give you visions of the future when you follow him. So they start exploiting this. They're, they're kind of like Malkavians in a way when they, when they do this. They will sit down and say, I am Madame Shablah blah blah. I can tell your future if you give me five silver coins. And then they'll just call Owl. And Owl will give them a vision of the future. And then they'll just read that and say, Oh, the crystal ball is showing me blah blah blah. And they start using that as a racket to get money. And it works. It's some Wayfair <laughs> shit right it's a, there. It's a very smart way to get some money as a sound shredder. Because, yeah, you you are telling the future. You're not lying. Yeah. And they run this racket throughout the Middle Ages. And try rubbing some shoulders with some other tribes. They get along fine with a few of them. We'll detail that more later in, um, in relationships. And... As busy as the Shell Shredders are, they learn that they're really good at killing vampires. The Convention of Thorns and the Anarch Revolt happen around this time, and they realize that with the knowledge they gained and passed on from killing Sutek, uh, Set, they have a natural talent for just finding a vampire, stalking him for a few days, and killing him. I mean, you'll have a vampire who's feeling good within his haven, and then all of a sudden a sound starter will just appear behind them and ruin their day. I just posted a picture in history pages. Yeah, that's just, that's the relationship between the sound striders on the left and every vampire from any clan on the right. <laughs> oh, what, Dio? <laughs> yeah, uh, D that's Dio versus Alucard. Oh, yeah. At the video. No. <laughs> yeah, ignore the hermetic symbol. Just imagine that as Owl working his magic through a silent shredder. It's it so, it funny because I was actually Annie. playing fucking, um, what was it? Um, Curse of Strahd earlier today with my sister. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah, and your, your sister has all this. Like, did she do the Strahd encounter? Uh, no, not, we're pretty early. Our sessions only last like three hours. We're still in the death house. Uh, you'll, you'll know what I mean when I say the strut encounter when you encounter it. Well, we, we found the letter emailed to the, uh, or no, not email. What am I talking about? We found the letter that was messaged to the owner of the household that was doing the ritual sacrifices. I, I, I won't spoil it yet. I'll, I'll okay. just wait for it to happen to you in game. And also I so found a part of my gun. <laughs> Marcus doesn't know what it is yet, but he's gonna figure it out. It doesn't matter what vampire it is. La Sabra, Zamichi, Bali, True Bruja, daughter of Cacophony. You just come in with that clog blood gift and hunts over. The hunt might as well have solved itself because you're fighting an average human by the point. And you're a werewolf. Go to town. Have fun. The vampires this is just a little strawberry parfait and you're a giant spoon. That's a, that's a weird analogy I just made up. What the fuck I, did I, I just don't say? know, but I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm so they spend so much time playing with vampires that when colonization happens, they realize, ah, oh, shit, we forgot to go to America. So they go to America pretty late. They say, this is um, a new continent. Let's check it out. We haven't heard of this place. The Tenna don't talk to us. The Winnego don't talk to us. The Croatan don't talk to us. Uh, let's say hello to our neighbors. So they go over, and they're in the middle of the Revolutionary War when they come over. They try talking to the Wendigo. The Wendigo don't even let them get a word out before they start killing Silent Striders. And okay, well, thanks a lot, asshole. We'll just go talk to the Ectena. Nope, the Ectena think they're Shadow Lords and start killing them. Well, we have two out of three. This is looking pretty bad. Let's talk to the Croatan. And the Croatan cling to the Sonic Striders. They immediately hit it off. The Croatan are desperate for help at this situation. And the Croatan start telling the Sonic Striders these stupid MF Shadow Lords just released the Eater of Souls from South America, and he's making his way over here, and he's going to kill everything if he appears outside the Umbra, in the material plane. The Shredders say, oh shit, what can we do to help you? 
we know a thing or two about killing gods. So the Croton and Silent Striders hit it off. These guys are attached to the hip. This is like the Fianna and the White Howlers all over again. And of course, you know how the story ends. These yep. guys have to do the sacrifice. They look at all the ways on how to fight the Eater of Souls and figure that the only way we can stop it is by doing the entire tribe sacrifice. The Croton learned how to do this after talking to the Silent Striders. So, a few Silent Striders stay behind. I think I might have glitched out for a second. A little Did bit. I? I a little bit, but I'd still, it's still good. The Silent Striders, a few of them stay with the Croton to the bitter end and do the tribe sacrifice alongside the Croton. And a few of them die in order to prevent the Eater of Souls from appearing. And we've said before... I'm pr probably outside of episodes that the Geta Finris are the heroes of World of Darkness. These guys, I can't name a single bad thing that Silent Stars have done. Just being with the Croton in their last moments shoots it over the hill for me with the Silent Striders. Nope. These guys are so cool, dude. And once Just again, why that. I say the Silent Striders need to see a chiropractor for how much their back hurts for carrying the entire Garrow. Oh, man. And that had to hurt because, you know, we just made a amazing friend with the Croton, and we just lost him. And to respect the Croton, we're going to respect one of their dying wishes, which is we're not going to take one of their cairns after they die. We're going to leave, we're going to leave them alone. And the Wendigo see them do that and say, well, these Fianna and Geta Fenris are pieces of shit, took all these cairns, just disrespected the memory of the Croton. You didn't do that. Uh, we're sorry about killing you. Can you tell us who you are again? And so the Silent Striders forgive the Wendigo and start talking with them. And then after talking with the Wendigo, the Octena, of course, see that. And they start talking with the Silent Striders to give them a last chance and bury the hatchet with the Silent Striders. And after those two experiences, the Silent Striders say, well, let's do the same thing with our age-old enemy, the Macaulay. They go over to... Well, it's not Egypt. They go over and talk to the Macaulay leadership, and they say, we're sorry about the War of Rage. We, we're sorry that we almost drove you to extinction. We're looking to bury the hatchet for the sake of Gaia, for the sake of the wild. Can you accept our apology? And the Macaulay accept! And the Macaulay and Silent Striders bury the hatchet. And the Silent Striders have the best relationship with the Macaulay. Because they are the... I think they are the only tribe that formally apologized for the War of Rage. The, the heart on these guys. They like the, got, the valor and the love and compassion. They have got positive karma. Uh, th these guys will send them cool, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like I said, when I started reading about them, they grew on me tremendously. So... These guys were doing pretty well. Uh, now comes the bad part. The Ottoman Empire falls, and the Silent Striders are very happy, very happy that the Ottomans are gone. Nobody liked the Ottoman Empire. And they do thank the Geta Fenris for doing that. They say, thank you for infiltrating the Allies and helping the fall of the Ottoman Empire. But that's the one thing we're going to thank you for. Because you fucked up real bad about what we're going to start talking about. The Silent Striders are minding their own business in their little base in Jerusalem. And they start seeing the Nazi Thule Society. The hermetic mages that sided with Nazi Germany. Sniffing around, looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Looking for the Holy Grail. Looking for the Holy Sword. And uh-oh. Uh-oh. World War II happens, and boom, they target the Silent Striders. I mean, their skin is dark, they're friends with the Jews, it's time to kill them. And blow this picture up that I just pasted in um, in history pages. Alright, give me a sec. Oh and my with the Holocaust, Jesus. That six, that's 11 million rates that you just made that are going to start harassing the Silent Striders. That this is from the, the, the Holocaust book in Wraith, and that really puts into a depiction. That, that's just one concentration camp. 
And you see how long that line goes on for. It's just hours and hours and days. It's terrifying. Your, your chance to pass into Stygia will happen when the boulders have turned to sand. That's how long you're waiting. And this rocks the South Shredders. They were beginning to make some progress, and they specifically get harassed by the Nazis that work, uh, the, the Hermetic mages that work for the Nazis, the Tremere anti tribu in particular. And the Get Ephemeris, yeah, they eventually came to the help the South Shredders, but it was 1944. It was way too late for response. Not only that, but the Sonic Striders saw the formation of the Swords of Heimdall, the Gerefenris who lost the plot and joined Nazi Germany, and they never forgave the Gerefenris for doing that. You were supposed to help us, but instead you sided with the enemy, and you, you want to say that you are the champions of Gaia? You're the champion of shit because of that. And... The Gerefenris did clean up their mess, but that is way too little too late for the Sonic Shredders because a oh, shitload of them died from the Holocaust. And, yeah, you can have a Sonic Shredder work with the Gerefenris, but they will always hold the Swords of Heimdall over their heads because of just how poor the response was during World War II. Yeah, uh, they don't say that to the Silver progress. Fangs or Shellwords, though. Well, I mean, we'll we'll get into how they feel about the about Silver Fangs and Shadow Lords later. And then, of course, you have all the shit that goes on in the Middle East after this. Um, I, it's funny that they bring up the the Jews who survived the um, the Holocaust as the Zionist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's a whole other can of worms right there. Uh, uh, ooh, just went a little wild here, didn't we? <laughs> oh boy, shit gonna get a little rough. So, if, if you want to put Alex Jones in your game, make him a Sonic Strider kinfolk. <laughs> I, I was saying always, it, look, if you ever want to make Alex Jones a part, of, I honestly think if they, he ever, like, decided to do voice acting, me and John both agree, he would be a great head of the IAA. That would be awesome. It, it, uh, Jones, why don't you do voiceover work? Just start a Fiverr account. We will pay you to voice our werewolf game. <laughs> oh, it'd be fucking sick. I'd love it. Before we know it, we will have spent $500 on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, st stop selling iodine. Stop selling turmeric formula. Just do, just do voiceover work. Yes. So, you know that by the time Israel forms and the Anthropocene era starts, the Middle East becomes pretty tumultuous. I mean, you have incident after incident happen here. You have so many different civil wars. You have the Lebanese Civil War, Syria. You have the Iranian hostage crisis. You have all the wars for oil. You have the Gulf War. So much shit here that we just don't have enough time to detail all the wars. And something they don't bring up in the book because it didn't happen yet. Arab Spring. Just imagine how how tough it would be to be a Sonic Strider after that happens. Pretty rough. Russia has a Russia has a massive brush fire, loses a third of their wheat, they sell all their wheat to the Middle East, and now we don't have any bread, and a guy is going to set himself on fire in protest, and it's going to cause riots across the entire peninsula. Fun time to be a Sonic Strider. Oh, but, yeah. They are a little happy that this happened because now it is very difficult to be a vampire in the Middle East. Because of all the tumult, tumult that's going on, being a vampire is a very risky game in the Middle East. So it made their job as vampire hunters much easier. They just need to be very careful around humans now. And 9-11, um, we get to talk about 9-11, Kyle. We get to talk about 9-11. Oh, lovely. Uh, quick, send me that meme of the two buildings smoking a joint. Yeah, send a picture of the turning red red panda crashing into him. <laughs> you put the put the video of uh, of Zach Idell yelling <laughs> they hit the Pentagon. See, 
And they this video be, this movie didn't discuss 9-11, which makes it behind the time. <laughs> it was yeah, a Disney I, movie. What the fuck do you think? Who the, who the fuck actually said that first? Because kudos to that Mysterious guy. Mr. Enter. Um. Mysterious Mr. Enter. <laughs> I'm familiar... I'm familiar with that guy's content. It's been shit for years. Don't worry. Oh, man. I'm really glad we don't run ads on this shit. We get demonetized so fucking fast. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Uh, I'm trying to catch my breath from laughing. <laughs> so, they say because 9-11 had to happen, because you blew up the damn Twin Towers, they don't mention George Bush. That conspiracy didn't take wind yet. They say because of that, the United States Army just has to be involved with everything that goes on in the Middle East now and in Central Asia. Any country that ends in the stand, it has to have U.S. troops in it. And because of that, the worm has infiltrated the U.S. military and there's IAA hunters and it is now very difficult to be a silent strider in the Middle East. Because of that, we had a few good years between 1970 and 2001. And now it is very difficult to do our thing because Uncle Sam is after us. Great. Yes. You, know, so you just had to. You just had to do 9/11. You just had to collaborate with whoever was behind that. And now we just can't do our thing anymore. Great. Just cause all so kinds. Now of they're trouble. mercenaries. What? Just cause all kinds of trouble. Yeah, just cause all it causes all kinds of trouble, and now we have to find work. In Europe and North America and Russia and China, and uh, we're even farther from home now. Um, Silent Shredders, a few of them can go into Egypt, but you need to follow a totem that is outside of Owl's Brood because Owl is directly connected to the curse. They will never abandon Owl because you don't walk on the family as a werewolf. You just don't ever do that. I remember Werewolf Den brought that up. And that was such a stupid point to bring up in this. Because, dude, why would you abandon Owl? He's family. You don't abandon family as a werewolf. Absolutely. And the rest is history. Modern day history. Um, name any modern day Arabian Peninsula conflict and put some Silent Striders in it. And there you go. Oh, also, the Weekend Nightmares happened. Uh, the Silent Striders stayed out of that. They weren't involved with Ravana's death. Uh, so, don't worry, the Silent Striders didn't incriminate themselves during that. Yay! Yeah, all kinds of laws. Let's do camps. Yes, okay, camp time. Everybody pack your bags, we're going on a little trip. And by yeah, that, I mean we're... Ca- name. A what? With some very simplistic names. Yes, which I'm actually okay with. So, yeah, you've let's got get The started. Wandering Rovers, the Sacred Hoop... The Seekers. <laughs> okay, so to start off camps, uh, first I want to talk about is the Seekers. The Seekers are the oldest camp of the Silent Striders. They were the first to travel to the lands of Cairn. They traveled the Nile, crossed the sands into the Umbra. Uh, they brought back whatever old scrap, whatever odd scraps and spirit, uh, spirit and unusual fetishes they can find. And wherever the worm lurked, they would fight it. Uh, Mostly, the Seekers are on a constant quest for a way to break Set's curse and regain contact with their ancestors. They are the most knowledgeable and the most intelligent out of all the Silent Strider camps. They always try to learn opposing survival skills. Like, if someone is born Lupus, they will try to learn how to be around humans. If someone is born Hamid, they will try to get back in touch with the wild. Learning their ancestry is lethally important to the Seekers. Um, Midas tend to focus on Garrow culture and the Umbra in order to find information through the spirits. And also within the the different auspices, this book was actually really helpful on camps. I'd highly recommend the Silent Uh, Striders. It was. So the Ragabash... The the wiki provides... The, the wiki provides such a skin deep analysis of the camps. Yeah, I now, these guys go in depth on the camps. I have it on the screen just for like some people like see that surface level while I'm talking about it, but just for for their exactly. sake. So the ragabash in the seekers tend to hunt for the secrets deep within the strata, the Garo lore. Theer just like to focus on the spirits to search for new rites, gifts, digging up lost fetishes. 
Um, Philodox usually become historians and detectives. Galliard use the lore of the past in order to inspire the president. And the Arun do what Arun do best, and they kill shit. <laughs> the Arun of the right, Warriors man. of the Seekers. I honestly really love this camp just because... Like, I love detective work, and I think a fil if, if I were to play a Silent Strider, I would be a Philodox Seeker. That'd be, that'd it, be it's awesome. It's cool, be because these guys are going out and they're trying to save Owl, because the curse affects him. If you are a Seeker, you are actively helping your totem. And not even the Geta Fenris do that. The Geta Fenris just resign... Fenris to his fate of being chained in the deep umber forever. These guys are actively trying to help Owl get away from Set. That's so damn cool that they do that. Yeah, because... And Go ahead. I want to put a little timeline out. The Impergium happened in the year 10,000 BC at the start of the Neolithic Age. According to context clues, they don't exactly give an exact year for when the Impergium starts, but that's more than likely when it did happen because they mentioned in the Silent Stars book that they started the Imperium when humans started farming. The events of the Setites started in 4000 BC. This has been 6,000 years they've been trying to solve this curse. Whatever curse they placed on uh, the set placed on Owl, that has been a tough nut to crack. And that's part that's part of the reason I research. I that's part of the reason I love the seekers so much is like their willingness to to learn to they they do what I don't think any other werewolf tribe really does and they take to heart incredibly well how important the family is for all the Garrow. Uh moving yeah, on from that stay, what's up stay with that family for 6000 years and you want to talk about how many times it took Thomas Edison to make one light bulb imagine trying to make the light bulb across 6000 years that's exactly what they're doing uh moving it's on pain. moving on from that we have the harbingers which is the second oldest camp in the silent striders they were actually once members of the seekers they were most frequently the ones who returned with warnings of the worm and other threats to the garrow uh, Harbingers are focused on, while well, the Seekers are focused on uncovering the past, the Harbingers are focused on uncovering the secrets of the future. They seek out every prophecy that they're given and every prediction that they have, and they sort of became their own camp when they were driven from, uh, when they were driven from Kemet in, in uh, Egypt. Many still see the Harbingers as a warning of incoming death, and each carry countless visions of the future. Lupus born harbingers seek signs of the future out in the wilderness to warn the red talons. Human harbingers tend to warn the people, uh, the human kindred and kim folk, and interpret older warnings. Midas seek the signs within the umbra. This is a running theme within their camps is that anyone who's born Midas, they always they always task them with uh, with doing research into the umbra and the spirits. Um, Unless you're a wayfarer, we'll get into that later. Um, the as for the auspices, the ragabash tend to rouse the people into action rather than just relaying the message. They're sort of like the Paul Revere's of the Silent Striders. The theurges focus on the spiritual dangers, corruption internally, etc. Philodox, if a Philodox harbinger shows up with a warning everyone's blood runs cold they warn of any internal conspiracy they are the counter spies of the uh of the garrow the galliard harbin the galliard harbingers um they tr they try to save the seps that are falling in danger of of despair if something is going wrong they're there to pick people back up dust people off and say we still got this get your shit together and arun again are arun they kill shit all Harbingers mm -hmm. are probably some of the most renowned warriors in the uh, Silent Striders. They kind of have to be. They're the first responders to any emergency. Mm. These guys are fucking awesome, man. And they, they got a lot of validity after the Red Star appeared in 1999. Um the Red Star, for context, that's setting up the Wormwood scenario in Gehenna and the Ragnarok scenario in apocalypse that's what that red star is supposed to mean yep bad news and they're the ones to tell everybody about it 
Okay. Th that's the burning angel that uh, Firewalker saw. <laughs> yes. So, next, uh, Sad Boys the Dispossessed. They came into being shortly <laughs> after Exile from Comet. Uh, they have been searching for a new home for the Silent Striders. They're kind of sick of wandering around everywhere, and they want another base that was as strong as Egypt was. And so they can find a place to gather enough forces and enough gnosis to eventually take on the uh, cult of Sutka. Or, I think I'm saying that right. Is that right? Su Sutek. Sutek. I don't know why I said Sutka. It's what they call Set. Yeah. Sutek is how it's written in the book, but that is the cult of Set. Uh, the only issue between them is that none of them really agree on where the new homeland should be. They attempted to settle the Pure Lands and among the Bunyip sold holdings... Then the second war of rage kept them from settling in the Pure Lands, and the Octena already took the Bunyip holds. Uh, India was the first place they tried, as we said earlier. Some some Garo that exist in India see them as outsiders, but they still will let them live there. Central Asia worked a little bit better because the nomadic home clans made for good kinfolk. Some tried the U.S. Some tried. Some began to call Af Africa their protectorate. Began mining raiding there. The European striders have been thrown in with the Shadow Lord leaders in an attempt to retake Egypt. Uh, to them, Kemet is the most important because Gaia entrusted them with it. That was their home, and they they felt like they lost it. Uh, most of the for the Lord, most of the dispossessed are actually human born, uh, as far as the lore says. Uh, for the auspices, the Ragabash move sort of unseen into cultures they've chosen to call their new homes. They sort of watch and learn, and they sort of work in they sort of work in the background of the new cultures that they're learning to sort of turn their culture into more Gaian ideals, make them care more about the planet that they that Mother Gaia has provided them. Theurges try to get in tune with local spirits, local religions, and superstitions. Uh, Philodox learn the laws and taboos of the culture. They maintain justice between the uh, between the Garo that moved to a new place. Galliards learn the culture's history and lore, um, and local customs and everything. And Arun, whenever they try and find a new home, they defend whoever their newly adopted kinfolk are. So, like we said, that the Silent Striders are basically the couch surfers. These are the people that are constantly looking for new roommates. They're like the, they they want to settle down, but they just can't quite keep it together. They had a really nice place a little while ago, and then like their landlord fucked with them. That being set, and now they feel bad that they fucked up, and they want to eventually go back to that nice place they had. So they're kind there's of one. What's up? There's one good spot that they could make a home, Mongolia. In the final night setting, because uh, Mongol Mongolia, that's mage tradition territory. There's just an issue. You have to either strike a deal with the Akashic Brotherhood, or a deal with the Shadow Lords as to why you should have a cairn there and why that should be your central cairn. And neither of them are really willing to give up their space. Yeah, but that would be a good spot to set up your home. Yep. More on the Akashic later. So, next, the Swords of the Night. So, these guys started back in... Oh, e uh, what? This, 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 is, this is our favorite camp. our favorite <laughs> camp. So, they started back in Egypt. They were the leaders of war against the cult of Set. And they used... And back in that time, they used to be called the Daggers of Newt. And they continued to fight even after Egypt was lost. They took to heart, you know... Fight the worm wherever it breeds, wherever it dwells. That is their mantra, really. And they also joined in a lot on the fun on the vampire hunting because they were really good at it. And because the undead would follow them wherever they went, the elders had eventually had to force the Daggers of Newt to disband, and no one had seen them since until very recently. So the Harbingers had been warning for a long time about the rise in vampire activity, especially as they joined with the technocrats, began to began to rapidly improve their their leadership and slowly began to to infest the world. And at that time the dag it was actually known that the daggers of Newt had actually just sort of instead of been disbanded, they sort of just became an underground secret society for the um 
for the for the silent striders the swords of the night basically just said wake us when you need us is what they did mm. rag so for the auspices of the swords of the night uh ragabash they they're the vampire stalkers they're the ones mm-hmm. that sneak up behind them use the heart clog cut off their auspices and then just tear them apart the urges like to gather allies from the spirit world um philodox they try in order they try to cut the vampires you know circle of communications cut their influence spread rumors about them to any humans that they might have come into contact with they want to cut them off from any potential food or power source and the galliards they find allies among other tribes rouse armies to fight vampires wherever they're at and the arum they were the ones who faced them in battle once they have the vampire cordoned off and weakened up the arum go in and finish them off and these guys there are horror stories amongst vampires about werewolves. Most of those come from these guys. Because, yeah, yeah, a, a, a get a famous and a glasswalker, that makes for a pretty deadly vampire assassin. You won't even know a silent strider is sneaking up on you. Because they have two means of getting inside of your haven. The Umbra and the Shadowlands. And this is the sneakiest assassin because all of your detection methods, even if you're a part of Pentex and you hire a Black Spiral Dancer to monitor the Umbra, they can ha- you, they can still use the Shadowlands and the Black Spiral Dancers haven't figured that one out yet. Yeah, they, they can so, move the um, they can move the Umbra, the Black Spiral Dancers, but they cannot get to the Shadowlands. Teleports behind you, nothing personal, kid. That is Sticks what you to the heart. That is what Swords of the Night do. Uh, next, we we mentioned these earlier, the Wayfarers. So a mm. lot of the Silent Strider leadership doesn't really like them because they believe that they are mercenaries who either have no loyalty to, to Mother Gaia or wavering loyalty at best. Give it one second. We are recording again. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, my PC hey, no decided to shit guy. itself. <laughs> We're doing lovely, fantastic. The, the damn globalist wants to stop talking about the Zionists. It's because we. It's because we mentioned Alex Jones. That was what did it. it we mentioned Alex Jones. We brought up George Soros. We didn't actually. Well, we did. We talked about. We talked about Zionists. <laughs> and let me knock on wood again. So. And pray to my ancestors so that it doesn't happen again. So, we were talking about the Wayfarers before my PC shit itself. So, like I was saying, a lot of the Silent Striders don't necessarily like them because they think they are mercenaries who have wavering loyalty at best and no loyalty at worst to Mother Gaia. And they that they believe that sort of attitude is just part of Set's curse because after Set's curse the silent striders had nothing they had no home they had no way to contact their ancestors and all of their ancestral knowledge was lost so in order to try and build a new life for themselves they sort of became the mercenaries of the silent striders way some wayfarers work for money some other work for political favor at moots for a right to stay in a cairn or to gain instruction for gifts and rights and because of this, every Wayfarer sort of has to be a skilled negotiator in order to get what they want. For the different breeds, Hamids likely work for money because they're Hamids. They need to look and act like humans. Uh, Midas usually take jobs for political power, either within the Garrow or outside of the Garrow, as well as the right to actually visit Cairns and sleep on their couch to get Gnosis back. Um... Lupus usually take jobs in order to learn rights or gifts. As for the different auspices, the Ragabash are usually hired as thieves and spies, given they're really sneaky, they're really good at, be- at working in the shadows. Theurges usually hire themselves out as spiritual, su- spiritual specialists or consultants. If you're having a problem with your, your uh, spirits, uh, call your local Wayfarer Theurge. Philodox work as investigators for hire. They're again another version of the the private. They're they're more they're less of the investigators that the seekers are, mm-hmm. and more just private eyes. The galliards mm-hmm. tend to work as messengers and bonded couriers or jack of all trades, as the typical bard would. 
and Arun are hired muscle. As the book describes them, they are bodyguards and leg breakers. If you need to solve a problem on a budget, call the Wayfarers. And now the two weird camps. Two fucked camps. Let's call them that. The first, Eaters of the Dead. They were supposedly once members of the Seekers until they found out that you could eat the brain of a corpse in order to get all of their memories out of it. Uh, some people, I don't know how they learned that, but they figured it out. I guess somebody like got some brain in their mouth when they were trying to kill somebody and like saw a bunch I mean, of visions. Al, Al didn't tell them that. That would make sense. Um, and However, some found out that the mind managed to carry the taint of the worm along with it, and if you ate one with worm in it, you would basically go insane. Some even developed an addiction to eating brains. That was if, if I may pause you there. Yeah, that's exactly how the red talons fall in times of judgment, from doing that, from eating brain. Yeah, and they don't. Nobody tells them about the worm taint, so they just keep doing it. This is why uh, devouring human flesh is strictly forbidden in the litany. Because you go fucking crazy from doing it. Yes. So, Philodox and even Ragabash actually began to question once some started doing that if it violated the litany. The elders decided the risk of worm taint was too great despite its power, and thus it was declared, you know, it violated the litany. However, a lot of those that continued to eat brains were far too gone in order to be saved by any sort of spiritual existence, and they sort of existed as this secret cult since then, going on devouring brains despite their addiction. Uh, so you got these guys like rubbing their silverware together again. Mm, we got this delicious <laughs> stuff like elder. We're going to cut up in his skull. Now we got to keep him alive. We got to keep his. Why do you have a sharpening knife steel. in your fucking room? What is that? <laughs> For the sound effect. Oh, did you bring that up just because of the Eaters of the Dead? Yes. What? <laughs> we got to keep, keep him pinned to the chair. Keep We're it lighthearted. Cut off the scalp. We're going to eat his spring with a spoon. With, who is it we were talking about of, of Hannibal Lecter, like, describing how he ate his friend? Were we talking about the ministry yeah, when we did that? The, the Wendigo. It was, yeah, it was the Wendigo, wasn't it? Okay. Um, and we're, go we're going to carefully eat the brain, then we're going to learn how to get rid of Al's curse through eating the Setite brain. Yeah. Delicious. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> while the Eaters of the Dead are, as the book describes them, just kind of gross, these guys are just <laughs> scary. The bitter hex, they will terrorize oh, yeah. and kill anyone. When they don't kill somebody, they curse them. When And they say in the book that the bitter hex are actually incredibly uh, intelligent, and any curse they put on somebody is both painful and poetic. Liars are basically made inert. Uh, bullies are left entirely weak, and killers are haunted by the memory of everyone they've ever killed. Um, most information on the Bitter Hex is second or third hand, because most that come across them usually don't live to tell about them. And those are the camps of the uh, Silent Striders. I've got a very good idea as to who these guys work with. Oh, yeah? I, I told you a little bit about Changeling. Uh, the, yes. The Slua. The, uh, I can see these guys working with the Slua. Yeah, I, the I don't know. First... The, the Slua are the ones that, like, will will teach kids how to do tarot card readings and that kind of thing, right? Red and Cosby whisper because they're cursed to only ever whisper whenever they speak to somebody. This is as loud as a Slua I can get. Oh, I'm really glad he's he's the lead guitarist in, in, in my character's band, not not a lead singer. The, the, thing, the thing with the Slua... The first thing you read in their kith book, all of the Changing the Dreaming kith start with a little fairy tale. The Slua book is specifically about three of them kidnapping and killing a child, specifically because he's a bully. Yeah, the, it's a horror story. The the Slua are are like the Slua are the changelings that will that will keep the potential school sh school shooter from sh from shooting up his school because that bully yeah. will be dead. He won't have to do it anymore. He's going to die because the Slua majority of them are sided have sided with the unseelie court. Yes. So if you want to mix books, 
I can 100% see the bitter hex working with the unseely court, and I can see them not caring about the eternal winter. Because, but let's face it, the eternal winter isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen. If the if the changing had, if the changes had the chance to change the world, the shattering wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So don't worry about the unseely court. They're not going to accomplish anything. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Okay, uh, do you, you want to... Work with the Unseelie all you want. So I kind of talked already about what all the different auspices do within the, within the camps, unless you, unless you have some more to, uh, to talk about with that. Something I want to bring up, I'm going to bring up a little bit about mixing splats again, wraiths. This is a very unique tribe because the wraith, wraith the Oblivion is deeply tied in with them as a tribe. Anubis, he's not a member of the Silent Striders, but he is a death god who takes on their visage, and he is the leader of their own part of the Shadowlands, Da'at. And from their experience of going into the Shadowlands before, with the help of Owl, and a little bit of help from Anubis to fight that worm cult, these guys know their wraiths. And I can see them talking with a lot of the different legions, specifically the Grim Legion. That is probably their best customer. The Grim Legion are um, rates who have died from violence. Majority of them are war veterans. And majority of them go around and kill people in the material plane. Or other rates. So, your Theurges, your Philodoxes, your Aruns, I want to bring that up. Your Theurge is not just talking to the Death Spirits of Owl, he's talking to Wraiths too. He's intentionally going out and looking for Wraiths, the same way that Giovanni does. And he's getting that Wraith on their side, and making the deal with them, as Theurges do, saying, If you scratch my nuts, I'll scratch yours. You help me in this fight against the Worm, I'll set you free. A Philodox will intentionally take the Wraiths that the Theurges come collected and will stick them on traitor Garu. That's brought up in the book. Where if a Garu is a traitor to the Garu nation uh, this may or may not be worse than Tupelok because a Tupelok will just kill you. Yep. Uh, a Wraith is going to torment you over a very long period of time and there's just nothing you can do about that. You have a chance to fight back against the Tupelok. Granted that's an in-game final boss that was sent after you if it's the Tupelok but a Wraith you just don't have an answer for. Um, very, very few werewolves outside the Silent Striders have an answer for finding a wraith. So this invisible, intangible, inaudible tormentor is just chasing you around for however long the, tor the punishment lasts. And if you're a Silent Strider Arun, you are hiring members of the Grim Legion to help you fight against the worm. You, I, I want you, if you are playing a Silent Strider Arun, to have an, an NPC following you that is a member of the Grim Legion, probably a war veteran given how the Grim Legion work, and I want him to follow you and be your ghost psychic, your ghost helper, and just punishing the, the, the forces of the worm and vampires. Because even though that Grim Legion Wraith won't get any kills, he will set you up for your Arun's kills. And that would be a great buddy cop duo between the two of you. I, yeah, I, I really like that idea. Um, I, I haven't read a whole lot in a wraith, but that sounds incredible. Yeah. And some of the tribal culture between these guys, well, like we said before, these guys are nomads. Um, I, I don't want to keep talking shit about Rich um, Werewolf Den, but yeah, this is something they fucked up. They said that these guys were just werewolf clones of the Ravnos. And that kind of just shows off like the internalized racism of that channel because you, you guys just didn't bother to learn anything about Arabic cultures before you just put your foot in your mouth and you fucking said that. Because, dude, being a nomad, that's a thing that happened in the Arabian Peninsula. You have so many tribes that live in the Ara Arabic Peninsula that still do that. Uh, do you want me to name some of these off? I may as well, yeah, since you're on the topic. Let's see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to less prepared for you. All right. I know I had a friend of mine in the uh, in the Middle East who was actually talking about some of the different uh, Arab tribes. He knows one of... I don't remember what they were called, but he said there's a tribe that lives in the north of Saudi Arabia that is sort of like the Texans of the Arabic Peninsula. Like, they would... 
<laughs> that whenever they have a wedding, all of the men would get a would get a magazine of AK ammo and just shoot the entire magazine off into the desert to celebrate the wedding. <laughs> I'm like, that's the most base shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> See, dude, I can tell you what the traps are who are doing this are. What's that? First of all, you have the Bedouins. Actually, that, that's a tribe that you can go out and you can talk to today. And those are a tribe of nomadic um, Arabs who still stick to that lifestyle. You have the, uh, oh god, this name, the Nabataeans, who, once again, they're still Arabs. And you have the, you have the Maghreb, who I don't think they do any nomading anymore, but do they still did that up until the 11th century, and then they kind of sort of settled down. Um, you know, we're talking about Brolf and not talking about nomadic tribes, but yeah, dude, you want to look into this shit before you say sh shit like that. It just shows so, that you know people need to need to put some effort in. It shows you that you never take a Marxist at his word. <laughs> that's a, that's a <laughs> Actually, got to turn down my thing. I'm a little I'm a little too loud. Let me crack that down slightly. There we go. Okay. Yep. Um, where are we? The at? laugh bomb. Uh, but yeah, these guys, but uh, they're they are nomadic and they're mercenaries too. Because if you need something done. You are kind of right saying that they have a little bit of Ravnos in them, but they also have Malkavian and Banu Hakim mixed in with them. The mercenary part being the Banu Hakim part. Because if you need something to die, you call a Red Talon. But if you need something supernatural dead, you call a Silent Strider for that. Because the Silent Strider, but once again, we would, we've already gone over this point several times. They, these is, this is the tribe that put Set in Torpor, and he has stayed in Torpor. If you need a vampire elder or a Milgen Incarna killed, you call these guys for it. And I want to bring up Times of Judgment, the Apocalypse book. These guys go out as champions. These guys go down as heroes. In their scenario in Times of Judgment, they realize that they need to do something along the lines of the Croton Sacrifice. But they don't exactly have a Defiler Worm to target, and the Calamity Worm is just kind of difficult. He, he's slippery. Yeah. So, they go into the Shadowlands, trying to figure out if there's a weapon there that they can use. They want to know if they can find the all-caps Oblivion, which is this the cosmic force of death. The Worm is not so much the force of death anymore, it's more about the corruption and despair, Oblivion, all caps, is death incarnate. And they find a creature in the Oblivion. They don't know what it's called, but it comes out of the Oblivion. It's completely dark, and it makes a pact with the Silent Striders. It says, I will give you power beyond your belief, but after a deadline that I determine that I won't tell you, I will take over all of your bodies, and I will use you as my puppets. And the Sonic Striders put in a desperate situation, seeing that the world is about to end, make the deal. And in that short amount of time, they kill three of the Melgen Incarna at least, and they stay dead. The Sonic Striders in this point of the um, of Times of Judgment are supercharged. They just need to make skin on skin t contact with you, and your entire body just disappears in thin air, and you're dead. You're not just dead; you're erased from existence. If they touch you. Jesus. But, of course, the pack goes through after and uh, a deter y y you determine how many they kill, but it's at least three. They lose themselves to the Oblivion. And then they turn on everyone. You now have this rapturous force of death spreading across the land as the Silent Striders. But before that happens, a lot of them will kill themselves before they let themselves get overtaken. They try screwing that oblivion monster out of the deal by intentionally turning their, their swords onto their necks and stabbing themselves like, like that. And they'll do whatever they can to try to soften the blow that they will deal to the Geru Nation. And honestly, out of all the Fallen Tribe scenarios, this is the one that causes the least amount of damage. It's Silent Strider's fall. Like, like, fall, I say in quotation marks, because they don't fall to the worm, they fall in a different way to whatever it was that talked to them out of the Oblivion. Yeah. 
Maybe that was a worm? Uh, I don't know. That could have been the Calamity Worm, but I don't think it was, dude. I think it was another entity. It, it is entirely possible because there's it, there's a whole lot of spirits at work but behind. And like we said, of all the uh, werewolf tribes, the Silent Striders have positive karma. It's like they would rather yeah. die than betray the Garrow. They've done spectacular work in, in defending as much as they can, and they bury the hatchet and they know how to forgive and forget when things go wrong if anything happens to them and if they avoid the oblivion they're gonna be okay if they pass they are going to be one with mother gaia mm. and I'll, i want to bring up too the silent striders existing it's just an indictment of the shadow lords as a tribe because what the fuck do the shadow lords do that a silent strider can't do better. You wanna, you want a werewolf that works like a vampire? The silent striders have the shadow lord speed. You want a group of werewolves that will go after vampires and successfully kill them? Well, we saw how badly the shadow lord screwed the pooch on that with Dracula. The silent striders killed an antediluvian. <laughs> yeah, they they know how to get you, shit done. You want messengers? Who deliver on res uh, who deliver results on par with the Corax? The Silent Striders have you beat. The Shell Lords are sucking up to the Corax. Yeah, you have and... the Harbingers. You got everything you need. And you could say, well, the Shell Lords. Well, what about the Catholic Church? Not only did the Shell Lords not infiltrate the Church, but the Glasswalkers and Children of Gaia and Black Furies infiltrated the damn Church, caused the Protestant Reformation. And loosened the Sabbat stranglehold on Europe. Those three tribes did what the Shell Lords failed to do that the Shell Lords tried once and then gave up on. And it kind of feels like there's just no reason to have the Shell Lords if you have Silent Striders in your game. We, I think we all know the, the Shadow Lords just the consummate fuck-ups of the Garrow. Like the, the Shell Lords are just poorly written. Just a horrible example of historical fiction. And I want to bring up how many people wrote the Silent Striders book. I'm looking at the second edition book specifically. You had um, Ethan Skimp, Robert Hatch, and they called in an Egyptologist, Ellen, El, Ellen Brundage, who still, I think she's still active because her website is still up. She still has a website that you can go to and you can look up Ellen Brundage. And the Shellard's book had one writer. Yeah, you know, that that says all you great, need right? to know. <laughs> like that when we were talking about the Wendigo, they talked to the actual Native Americans they based the legends off of, and it worked great because the window the Wendigo are an incredible tribe, and they're an incredibly well written tribe. You can mm -hmm. see where the effort is put into with the different books that you get and the different uh the different tribes you see in the Garo Nation. And if you, and if you want to get in my face about this, you want to straw man me. And you want to say, well, Ellen Brundage is white. Uh, here's my message to you. Fuck you. <laughs> You're, yeah, I'm, I'm not taking that back. Fuck right. you if you say that. So um, do we want to move on to uh, relationships with other camps? Or yes. do you want to do totems? Well, let's do relationships with other camps. Okay. And do totems. So uh, relationships with other camps. We're going to start with the Bonars. As we know. See, well, but with, wait, hold on a minute. With each of these tribes... I like how the Silent Striders break them out in the categories they have. It, it's kind of funny how they categorize the camps, too, because they have the werewolf tribes split into four categories. Your pariahs, your wise men, your honorable, and your glorious. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that's kind of And then the pariahs hilarious. is the bon is the bonars, the glasswalkers, and the red talons, and the pariahs. Yeah, um, they, they don't to, like um, them. Stick to two per category for this one, since we've gone on a little while. Yeah, okay, so, uh, pariahs. First, we have the uh, Bonars. As we discussed before, the totem for the Silent Striders is the Owl. And yes. they and because the... What do owls eat? Yeah, Bonars eat the rats. And because the Bonars are children of the rat totem, they don't get along. They, they, they think they're an unruly mob. They live on the very fringes of Garrow society. And a lot of them will look down on them for their undistinguished living and the fact they live in squalor. 
However, they do give them credit for being incredible survivalists. As the book states, you can put a bone gnar in a room that will have a thousand ways to kill them and they will live. So, hmm. while they can be powerful allies, they're not huge fans of them, but don't condescend them. I don't really need... Yeah, the, the two of them don't resent each other at all. No. It's just that Rat hates Owl just because of nature. Yeah. And... Well, Rat's Rat. Rat God is so damn strong, you can't really do anything about that. And if a Bonar helps a Silent Strider, they lose the favor of Rat. Mm hmm Okay. That's so, a big, big drawback if that happens. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to briefly touch on the Glass Walkers and talk about the Red Talons. The Glass Walkers, pretty obvious. The uh, Silent Striders think they're going to be to the Weaver what the Black Spiral Dancers are to the Worm. But for the time being, we still kind of need them for the for the way the world is as of right now. Uh, moving on from them, we have the Red Talons. The actually quote uh, Homer. I think this. I don't remember if this is Iliad or Odyssey. That he's. I think it's the Odyssey. Um, they quote Homer Simpson. Yeah, they. They said they quote Homer. There are no covenants between lions and men, only, and wolves and lambs have no concord. Said Homer J. Simpson. Uh, that is what's actually in the book. Um, they know that the Red Talons are consumed with hate for the human race, and though they have reason to be. Uh, humans have hunted werewolf kindred for years, but the Red Talons were charged by Gaia to watch over, protect, and guide wolf kinfolk and have failed. Gaia made mm -hmm. werewolves from human and wolf, and the Red Talons have completely forgot that. They've lost touch with their humanity more than the Glasswalkers have with Lupus. And if they continue to do so, they will eventually lose touch with the other tribes and no longer understand them. So that will be a huge amount of knowledge basically lost once the Red Talons mm -hmm. completely lose all of their humanity. Oh, oh yeah, the, the Red Talons, they look at the Sonic Shredders, too. They say, you kind of get where we're coming from, and we say, we lost everything. If only you just didn't have Hamids, we'd be friends. Yeah, because as we said, <laughs> like, Red Talons will not do anything that humans do. They will not drink, they won't screw for pleasure, they won't, go, they won't mm. you know, sit around a campfire and talk. The Red Talons are huge fucking prudes, and I don't know why John likes them so much. <laughs> well, well, we got to do an episode about them in, yes, in August. Yes, we do. Okay, um, moving on. Um, I'm gonna We're going to talk about the Children of Gaia, because how the book puts it is actually really fucking yes. funny. Um, yes. So, as the book says, everyone thinks the Children of Gaia are harmless except the silent striders they say that they've carefully crafted this perfect puppy dog image and the silent striders just aren't buying it they say that the children of gaia want to unify the gara nation and of course they want to be in charge and the silent and they think they have a better understanding of gaia than everyone else they think that they're far too smug and self-righteous and some of the they and the silent striders because of how observant they are they've noticed that some children of gaia think they should start trying to beat the garrow in line with them however not mm. to underestimate them because they play politics better than anyone better than the wayfarers better than better than any philodox in the silent striders the children of gaia are politicians and they're damn good at it they see the children of gaia and they know they're up to something. The ultimate goal of the Children of Gaia is that they're trying to usurp complete control of the Garu Nation from the Silver Fangs. Uh, something they're making a lot more progress in than the Shadow Lords. Once again, the Sucky Tribe, Children of Gaia, got you beat. Hmm. Yep. Um, and they know they're making progress because the Children of Gaia are using a lot of populist language that's getting humanity on their side. And they, whenever you try criticizing a child, a child of Gaia, they will start playing the victim card when you do that. Yeah. And they know where this is going to go. You're going to have tyrants who pretend that they're sweet, innocent little babies running the Garu Nation. And the Silent Striders really don't want that to happen. Yeah. Uh, for, so do you want me to move on to Shadow Lords or Silver Fangs? I think we've, we've been shitting on the... Uh, we've been shitting uh, on the... Fight the Shadow Lords. Just fight the Shadow Lords, Silver Fangs. Okay, <laughs> okay. so the Silver Fangs, as the Wendigo have likewise said, 
Um, the Silver Fangs are just kind of coasting on the deeds of their ancestors. They seek honor in their pedigree rather than what they do. And they say that all they do is they brag about who their ancestors are while everything crumbles around them. They demand obedience even if nothing is done. Uh, and they just ruthlessly cling to power. They undercut their own champions because they're afraid of threats to their rule. And they need to just take a lap and find their nobility again because they are very quickly losing favor with the rest of the Garrow as the leaders of the Garrow nation. The, so the Silent Striders are sick of them. And shit, it might be too late too because we detailed in the, in the Wendigo episode none of them live to the age of 30 because they're just that genetically fucked up. Elderly age is considered 25 if you are a, if you are a silver fang. So, good dude, old, that might be too late for them. They good old inbreeding, let's go. They might just have to retire being uh, silver fangs. But if they do that, they lose Falcon, and then what the fuck are the silver fangs going to be? What are they going to have after that? They're going to have to completely rebuild as a tribe. Yep. Okay. So, so you're going you're going to have to start from zero, and that's something that the silver fangs just weren't willing to do. Well, yeah, but then it'll more than likely it'll be the children of Gaia because they keep talking about stepping up to the throne. But you and I both agree, yeah. the Fianna should be there. The yeah, Fianna, the Fianna just uh, collapse the Silver Fangs and have all the Silver Fangs join the Fianna. Wait, well, no, that's not going to happen. The Fianna are going to kill the Silver Fangs. Yes, they they've, they've yeah. been betrayed by the Silver Fangs enough. They don't like them. The only issue with that is the Wendigo would they they kill. <clears throat> the Wendigo kill Fianna on sight. They probably wouldn't be happy about that. That would probably be a schism so the, that needs to work out. Our only bet is to get a Fenris. Uh, yeah, but even... There's a lot of people... The get a Fenris are really strong, and people and Gera respect them for it, but they also make a lot of enemies. Uh, because yeah. we talked about it earlier, I wanted to talk about the Cro their relationship with the Croatim for a bit. They know yes, them as the, yes. the middle brother of the Garo. They are strong-willed and pure hearts. They are tireless protectors. They won the respect of the Octena and the Wendigo, who always look to them for guidance. And the entire, as we said before, the entire tribe committed suicide to stop the Eater of Souls from materializing. And they did this all because of their honor. The Silver Fangs believe that the honor of the Croatan led to their own self-destruction. And while honor is good in order to preserve the the way of living of the Garo, it also winds up with a lot of dead heroes. And the Silver Fang cannot stress enough how much the Garo actually need dependable leadership. And they saw the Croatan as almost true successors to the to the um to the to the Shadow Lord or no the Silver Fangs, and they they're gone now. They they miss the they miss the Croatan as much as the Wendigo do. Yeah, I just posted in history pages. If you do a Victorian age, yes. uh, bit Werewolf game, this is the relationship between the Silver Fangs and the Croatan. Uh, let me do it right yeah. here. Oh, that's a. <laughs> it, it's it's a JoJo reference. Yeah, it's a motherfucking JoJo reference, and I'm gonna put it on screen for the whole world to see. <laughs> These guys are bros. You could also do you could also, do it, you could also do it with the Fianna and the White Howlers as well. Yeah. The Fianna and the White Howlers, the Wendigo and the Red Talons. Yep. There's a lot of a lot of ways for that. Um I think we just blew through all the bro tribes. No, there's one other bro there's one other bro tribe I wanna talk well yeah, I could talk about I could talk about the Fianna. Because, like we do already it. know that they, mm -hmm. they're they don't like to get ephemeris, but they do respect them for their strength. Um, mm -hmm. The Fianna, of course, every, of course they love the Fianna. <laughs> you could have no yeah, greater I've... friend and no more persistent enemy than the Fianna. They have a lust for life in all its glory. They'll swap stories. They always welcome the Silent Striders into their cairn. They'll always have interesting stories, and they'll always have good warnings of, of worm to kill. And it and every interaction between Silent Strider and Fianna ends with drinking, fighting, and fucking. Although yeah. they they they're kind of sick of the kilts, as the book says. Yeah. The next American Fianna I see wearing a kilt, I'm gonna shove a caber up his ass. 
I'm sick and tired of all you American Irish men who haven't gone to your home country. It's not. It's not my fault. It's my take over the arm. The only people that are left was, are about was, a half dozen dyers. That was Bono from U2 who said that in the middle of the show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's telling it like it is. Yep. He's telling it like it is. Okay. Um, I've got quite a few of them left, actually. Um, do you want me to... Uh, uh, pick, what? pick one more, and then we'll talk about the Corax. Okay. Um... They're, they're Who's another... it gonna be? I'm gonna thinking be either tried. the White Howlers or the Stargazers, actually. Well, the White Howlers are dead due to Stargazers. Okay, so the Stargazers. The Chimera's children struggle to answer the riddle of Moth. Uh, and the secret of how to restore balance to the triad end of the universe. They discovered countless other useful bits of information along their way. The Silent Striders, for this reason, have always gotten along with them. Similar to the Fianna, they love sharing stories with them. They have campfires where they share secrets with each other. And while their quest... But the only the only blemish that the Silent Striders have against the Stargazers, the Stargazers' search for answers has sort of led them away from the Garrow and their struggle. And they left a great deal of wisdom unavailable because they are sort of they've moved away from the Garrow. They the yeah. Silent Striders believe they can't let their quest for the world secrets distract them from their duty to Gaia. They love the Stargazers, but they kind of wish they'd get more involved. It said, "You guys lost your mind. You lost your mind. You've all gone crazy. You think the best way to fight the worm is to let the worm kill you." Did they actually? Good idea. Uh, the, sun, the Stargazers just don't do anything anymore, dude. They're just sitting in China, waiting for the world to end, and they're not doing anything about it. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of sad. The tribe as a whole has just given up, and they're just letting the Quay Jin kill them. Yeah. Okay. So the Rich. Korax, right? Yeah. Th this is the one tribe I can name that is kind of iffy with the Korax. Um. Go, uh, go, go, go ahead. Well, they they do like the fact that they travel as much as the Silent Striders, and they're very good messengers, and they are the only Pharaoh that they didn't try to kill during the War of Rage. Um, <laughs> they collect secrets and hate vampires just as much as the Silent Striders do. So just play nice with them, learn what they have to say because they got loose lips. Just watch your own lips because they are Korax, and just play nice with the Korax. Be nice to the bird. <laughs> the, the bird has a lot of cool stuff to say. Yep. Quick, Two quick notes about the uh, Adi and the Ratkin. The Adi, yeah. treat them with respect. Fuck off if they ask you to fuck off. Do not yeah, the, fuck with the Adi. Yeah, the, the African Beast Court. That's what that is. Yes. And likewise, the Ratkin. Now, nah, fuck the Ratkin. <laughs> That's so that's the only you, note I got was fuck the rack, Ken. You guys are so crazy that we have talked with the Red Talons, and they are put off by you, and you just refuse to work with us because we follow Owl. Dude, we're not gonna stop following Owl. If you want, if you and your rat god are gonna get this pissy, then fuck you. Basically, we don't, we don't like you either. <laughs> so that so no, sh Silent Striders and Ratkin don't get along. And it can work with the bonars, but the rat can just refuse to let it go. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to uh, let's move on to totems then. <laughs> yeah. Let's do totems. So owl, we we brought up owl. Yes. I brought up the owl, and it's it's uh it's a little weird because uh, Egyptian mythology itself doesn't really mention owl that much, but other cultures have a lot of things to say about owls. Native American mythology see owls as these little I don't want to say death card. they see them the same way the Japanese sees Shinigami where this is a spirit that will appear when somebody is going to die or somebody has died and they scoop up the soul in their talons and then fly away with it the aboriginals believe the same thing but in a nicer way the aboriginals of Australia believe <clears throat> yeah you cut out for a sec Hello? Oh, please tell me it's not fucking up again.
and then we'll Hold up. become the ferryman. You you cut out for a for a while there. Oh shit! All right. So the owls are kind of mixed up between um, different mythologies. The owl in Native American myth, it's seen as a harbinger of death. If somebody's going to die or somebody has died, an owl will be present. If you're aboriginal, an owl is a ferryman come to take your soul to um, to the afterlife or to be reincarnated. And then you have the Greeks who were sharing a lot of information with the Silent Striders at the time. The Silent Striders and Black Furies were neighbors. They didn't really talk to each other that much, but when they did... They had some pretty interesting conversations. And there's that image of the Owl of Athena. The wise owl. The owl that knows everything and understands everything. The owl totem is all three of those aspects rolled into one into one totem. The owl is very wise. It is a totem of wisdom. What owl will do for you? Owl's children will gain wings when they enter the Umbra. So that's pretty damn cool, isn't it? Yes. But bold, you have a flying speed. You also have two uh, um, two points of difficulty subtracted from any stealth roll or any roll that requires you being silent, and you will gain two points of wisdom renown for taking owl. If you take them as a pack, you will start getting Malkavian visions of the future by following owl. And he will give you three dice to any gift that will involve air travel, travel and ground, movement, or anything involving darkness. And Silent Striders will appear to aid you in any battle if the chips are down. The ban. You must take a rodent, tie him to a stick, and then leave that sticked rodent in the woods for an owl to eat. That's how you honor owl. An owl is pretty damn inexpensive, dude. He's only five points. You, that's that's probably why the uh, the rat can don't like them don't like owl very much. Yeah, because he demands a blood sacrifice, and this is the blood sacrifice. Yeah. So, I mean, dude, it's nature. Get over it. <laughs> y- you want to be a prey animal, you get eaten. This is what happens. This is why we're appeasing the honey badger in our in our game. I thought you guys were wild. I thought you guys loved nature. I, well, why don't you like this part of nature, huh? Yeah, really. Yes. Other totems. What I find really cool about the Silent Striders, their totems shift back and forth from death demigods and stars. This is one of them. North Star. They didn't really give a hoot about this guy. Oh, and I just made a damn pun. They didn't care about this guy back when they had the Nile River because the Nile flows to the north. That gives you an idea of where north is. But after they had to flee Egypt... The North Star became part of Al's brood. Al said, hey, you guys, I found this star. Let's start using this as a totem. What North Star will do is that every member who follows North Star will receive two additional dots of survival. They will also receive the gift area knowledge, which will add two little dots to a thing involving knowledge of the Northern Hemisphere. And upon acquiring North Star as a totem, Members of the pack will receive one point of temporary honor renown. Uh, you get a lot of bonuses with these guys. The ban. North Star requires that your pack travel constantly. You don't get a day off. You're constantly moving when you have North Star. It's, it might as well be like playing a Ravnos in 5e at this point. Um, given that you're moving from place to place to place every night. Now that these guys are Ravnos, they just have some similarities. Yep. I mean, that, that makes sense for like... Um... That it makes sense just given their, their given how they how they wander in all of their in all their different camps. If you're doing a big lupus game. Yes. <clears throat> Next up, the scarab. This is Kepri, who has died and has become a totem. He is a big scarab that pushes the sun around, and he's not part of Owl's brood. He's part of Helios' brood. The sun. The spirit that resides within the sun. So, enough Silent Striders will take this guy as a totem to where he's included in this book. So, what he does, well, he's... Y- y- you understand, like, the basic symbol of the Scarab in Egyptian mythology, that is the symbol of eternal life? Yeah. The Silent Striders get that, the all whole Euthanatos as above, so below, and they do that through Scarab. What Scarab will do for you, 
There was a lot of bonuses. Keep in mind, it only cost five points of background to get this guy. All the goodies you get. Altered of Skyrub. Learn the minor right, greet the sun. Once per story, each member of the pack may learn... May, um, sorry, may channel Scarab's regal bearing, radiating a light of the sun, and for the duration of the scene, when this power is involved, the child of Scarab is treated as though he has pure breed five. Holy shit. You are shit. treated as a small demigod amongst your people when you have the spirit up. For only when five When the child backers. of Scarab spins five and pure breed, dude. Jesus. When a child of Scarab spins willpower on... Extended rolls. Each point expended after the first round of the extended roll counts as two successes. And finally, during a brief duration of the natural solar eclip eclipse, each child of Scarab may add two dice to all actions. I mean, that, that seems kind of a selective environment. Like, solar eclipses are kind of rare. And you want to know the one and only drawback? What's that? That greet the sun right. You have to perform that every day. But, dude, that's easy enough. That's part of your morning routine. D dude, Scarab is so damn strong. Yes. And the ban isn't that and bad either. I have two more I want to talk about. Cobra. You look at the antenna, and the antenna majority of their totems are snakes. It's cool that these guys have a snake. Um, any and all snake totems had a connection to the worm, and this guy had a bit of a wormish connection until he saw what the worm was doing, specifically around the time when the Shadowland cult existed, and he sided with the Silent Striders. And then his power, his power only grew in viability as time went on. So, snake, th this snake, this cobra, is referred to as a she, by the way. And she is a cold-blooded killer. She is no-nonsense. She is a bad ass when you take her as a totem. What she will do for you? She will grant you immunity to snake venom. Pretty damn cool by itself, but... You will gain four additional soak dice to anything involving poison damage. And once per day, every member of a pack will gain the ability to deal... Four additional points of lethal poison damage with one bite attack. With one bite attack. If you mid max your build right, you will deal more damage than a Gadafin will do with Razor Claws. Yeah, that is that's fucking scary. And this works on vampires. <laughs> Just don't drink their so, blood. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that whole Bale's caress thing that you saw Sylvester doing in our in our vampire game. This is what they're doing. Jesus. The whole... But the ban. You must constantly seek a fight with vampires. You never get a day off with Cobra. You must always look for a vampire to kill. Yeah, this... this Granted, you were probably doing that anyway. The, the, the fucking Silent Striders... They just don't ever get a break. They never do. That's why I keep saying... Well, their back fucking hurts. <laughs> Well, there's one that they get a little bit of a break with. Crocodile. Even though he's a war totem, the, the, the benefits you get from following Crocodile. So that whole Macaulay apology, uh, the Macaulay said, well, why don't you follow our guy, Crocodile? And the Silent Strider said, we'll take you up on that. <clears throat> when you follow Crocodile, your teeth will grow in size, even in the Hamid form. While Crocodile is your totem, don't smile. If you don't want people to know you're a vampire, don't smile. Or smile in front of a changeling and get them to think you're a red, ca you're a red cap. Yep. <laughs> you, you prank the pranksters. <laughs> what, what Crocodile will do for you. So on top of additional bite damage, you will deal an additional day of damage with bite damage. But once per story, you can in instantly get a werewolf out of frenzy. You just point at them, say, stop being in Frenzy, and then we will stop being in Frenzy. You can only do that once per story, but that's going to be very helpful when your Geta Fenris kills all the enemies, and then he's still in Frenzy, and then he turns on you. That's going to be very helpful to have. 
Yes. The third thing. The third thing. The Macaulay will come to your aid if you request it, if you follow Crocodile. Oh, the were dinosaurs, the were dragons. <laughs> that's sick. Yep. You get to team up with your buddies King K. Rule, Clump, and Crusha if you take this guy. I'm okay with that. And Sharky. Always Sharky. And the ban. A pack that follows Crocodile may never harm a Macaulay. And that's honestly not that bad. Yeah, that's that's pretty reasonable. I mean, granted, a Macaulay could probably exploit that, but. That's typically not in the Macaulay's nature. No. You're you're not dealing with Shell Lord. You're dealing with a with a croc. Yes. And let's wrap this episode up with pick because we're doing a death theme. Pick four gifts and four rights. Go right. over. I'll start with uh, start with gifts. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about uh, death track, real quick. Where I can find it. Okay. This is a rank three silent strider gift. Sometimes someone's journey ends too soon. Man dying before he can tell the silent strider important things. With this gift, um, do not let, uh, hang on. Silent striders with this gift, do not let the end of someone's someone else's journey be the end of theirs. As long as the silent strider can find the body, they can follow the trails of the spirit until they find the ghost. Owl teaches this, or a servant of Owl teaches the gift. Uh, the Silent Strider stands over the body of the dead. The player spends a point of Gnosis, rules Perception, and Occult Difficulty 7. One, su one success is needed to smell the direction of the ghost from the body. Every day the search continues, another Perception Occult rule must be made, with one additional success required for each day spent searching. The Storyteller determines how far away the ghost is. That is lethally important, especially if you're a Harbinger. Remember that most... Every camp in the Silent Striders is obsessed with finding the right information in order to break curses, in order to remember their ancestors. It is all important. So being able to find a ghost that has very pertinent information is incredibly important right now. And especially if you want to solve a murder investigation, if that's involved in your story. I mean, this this right would just this this gift would just break the game if that was the case. Just find a silent strider with death track, boom, story over. Exactly. Uh, next, I want to talk about the touch of death. Since we're going with death mm -hmm. theme, this is a rank four silent strider gift. The Garo can inflict visions of death upon unsuspecting opponents. Worse, these vision these visions are highly personal premonitions of the opponent's untimely demise, as if someone had walked over their grave. The fear the fear this creates is paralyzing. In the worst cases, the victim falls catatonic and cannot be revived for days. On recovery, the stricken individual cannot remember the details of what so terrified him. Simply that involves their death. Victims who survive the encounter with the Eater of Death, the Eater of the Dead, are forever marked with a white lock or patch of hair. This gift is taught by a death spirit. The system. <laughs> the Garo must touch the victim. The player rolls dexterity and brawl if in combat, dexterity and stealth if sneaking unnoticed, or manipulation and subterfuge if casually touching them in the course of the conversation. On success, the player spends two points of Gnosis and rolls Manipulation and Occult, the difficulty of the victim's willpower. Uh, if the Eater of the Dead achieves more successes than the target has willpower, the victim becomes catatonic with fear. If the successes are fewer than the target's willpower, the target suffers a minus one penalty to all dice pools for each success due to the debilitating fear. In both cases, the successes are eliminated at the rate of one per day. A catatomic victim does not fully awaken until all initial successes are eliminated. That is terrifying. If you need yeah, to it, just immobilize somebody, touch of death is what you need. Keep in mind, this works on vampires too. Yes. If you have that Ventru vampire who's talking shit all day long, just go up to him, poke him between the eyes with this, and then put the fear of final death into him. Oh, yeah. Just empty. Scares the hell out of him. <laughs> and this one... It's lovely. This next one is arguably the most important out of all of them. This is the gift that killed Set. Rank 4 Silent Strider gift, 
damn the heart flood. No other tribe among the Garrow has as much hatred for vampires for as just a cause as the Silent Striders. It is no surprise then that the Striders sought out this gift, searching long through the spirit world and the physical world for the secret to incapacitating a vampire. They found an answer from the spirit ch children of Cobra, who taught them the spirit poison usable against the vampires who defiled Cobra's name. The system. Mm -hmm. This gift can only be used on supernatural creatures that use a blood pool to power their abilities. Vampires, ghouls, and the spider, and the Ana and the Anasi. Yeah. The player spends a point of gnosis and rules manipulation and medicine against the difficulty of the target's willpower. Each success renders the target unable to tap the power of their blood for one turn. They may not use any blood-related powers or spend blood points to heal wounds, activate disciplines or gifts, or for any other reason. A Garrow may only use this gift once per scene per target, but multiple werewolves together can envenom the same target. Again, if you're playing vampire and you come up against a rank 4 silent strider, you're fucked. You are yeah. fucked. <laughs> I kept this uh, close to my chest when I was talking about Cobra a few minutes ago. This is the reason why Cobra is with the brood. Because Cobra was looking at Set, taking the image of a snake and making it about himself with Serpentis. And Cobra took offense to that. I'm, I mean, you're taking my body and you're making it your symbol. I want nothing to do with you. I'm going to team up with these wolves and I'm going to put you down for dragging my name through the mud. Yeah, the, the the cobra is a very um, spiteful, uh, a very spiteful mm -hmm. totem, but that is she's a mean bitch, but she gets results. That is by far one of the most important uh, gifts of the Silent Striders. I'm gonna talk about one more, and then I'm gonna move on to rights real quick. Um, mm -hmm. This one I just thought was kind of cool. Uh, fetish doll. This is actually both mm. a well. This one is exclusive to the bitter hex gift. Or yeah, mm. bitter hex camp, and it's also oh, this was nasty, dude. A rank five Octena uh, doll, or Octena gift, the fetish doll. Uh, sympathetic magic is the oldest form of sorcery, and it is still effective. Although many cultures find the sort of magic rep repellent, the Octena believe that ends well justify the means. The Garrow can harm this victim from afar using a specially created tool, basically a voodoo doll. They must have a piece mm. of the victim or an object belonging to them, and they must construct the doll. An ancestor spirit teaches this gift. The system. The doll takes one week to construct and enchant. The player rolls perception and crafts with a difficulty eight to construct the doll. When the doll is complete, the player may roll intelligence, medicine, difficulty of the victim's willpower. Each success inflicts one level of aggravated damage on the victim, which they may soak if they are capable of doing so. The doll is only capable of transferring 10 levels of damage. After 10 successes, the doll is mutilated to is too mutilated to be of further use. A botched roll destroys the doll without inflicting any damage. Very high risk, very high reward. You have to ace that perception and crafts, and you have to ace that intelligence and medicine. And Doing keep so, in mind, 10 points of aggravated damage is a one-hit kill against majority of creatures in World of Darkness. Basically anything. This is this is about <laughs> as deadly to anything as the um as the as the ray gun is from Mage. Yeah, you you make the doll of that one Tremere that keeps sitting in his chantry that <clears throat> just won't leave. And you sit the doll down after you build it with the Actena or the Silent Striders. And you just take an axe and you chop that doll in two. Yup. Boom. Problem over. And problem like, solved. And like no that, more. you have two halves of a Tremere. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on to rights real quick because we are kind of running late. Um, mm -hmm. So we want to do uh, four of this one as well? Yes. Okay. This one I picked because I, given all the death we just talked about, I think this one's just kind of nice. It's It's sort of... Sort of jovial, like the uh, like the song of rest for the uh, for the Wendigo. Uh, level oh, one, right? Uh, right of meeting and parting. It's a minor right. So two striders meeting on the road is a very rare occurrence, but often very pleasant. If even if one or both are traveling on missions of desperate importance or even certain doom, at least for a short time, neither has to travel alone. <clears throat> 
Each traveler greets the other with a traditional salutation in his or her native tongue. If time permits, they share food and water and exchange news of their travels. On parting, they exchange blessings in the Garo tongue. The most common is Gaia soft beneath your feet, Luna light, Luna's light on your path. Even in emergencies, two striders who recognize each other will howl out as much of the greeting and farewell as they can pass each other at full sprint. The rite is not usually performed on arrival at a cairn, but silent strider cairns often have their own rituals to welcome travelers. I just think that's that's really sweet. It's silent striders, you don't... It's constant wanderers. It's just good to like actually have a friend on the road. Yeah, you get no benefits from doing that. It's just a nice little interaction. Yeah, if you if you have a very RP heavy campaign, I highly recommend uh, meeting and parting. Okay, uh, mm. level two. Do you want me to uh, do you want me to do right of purification or right of the jackdaw? Purification. Okay, this is a death rite. Uh, description: This is a burial ritual to honor the dead that is only performed by silent striders for their fallen tribe mates, only in the company of other striders. If there are members of other tribes who wish to mourn, a gathering for the departed will be held at another time and place. The system, the body of the deceased must be first washed. The rite of cleansing may be necessary if the werewolf died fighting the worm. After the body is laid out, the master of the rite invokes the scarab who sends beetle spirits from her brood to strip the hair, skin, and flesh from the body. When only the bones remain, the spirits depart, and the bones are placed in a small grave, preferably at a cairn. Other times, the bones are laid to rest in some space significant to the departed or simply by the roadside. This is no dishonor among the striders. It is the reality of a wanderer's life. Better to bury the bones when there is time than die carrying them and so leave two unburied. Again, this is this is a very bittersweet one because, you know, this is a this is an honorary way for a silent strider to go. The life on the road is mm -hmm. rough and it's be and it's good to it's good to at least lay where where there's friends around. It's sad yeah. but you're there but you know your friends are taking care of you right of purification sad but sweet um moving on yeah, level three and camp of death this is how they do it this is how they bury one of theirs when they die okay yeah uh level three uh descent into the underworld this is a mystic right so most Garo think of the mm -hmm. Umbra, the Gaian spirit world, as the only spirit realm that sits close to the physical world. The Underworld, however, the land of the dead, otherwise known as the Dark Umbra, sits astride the physical realm just as the Umbra does. Within it lie the ghosts of thousands of humans who died unable to let go of some aspect of their mortal lives. These days, the Underworld is a tremendously dangerous place. A few years ago, a cataclysm set off a series of hellish storms that still threatened to rip the lands of the dead apart. The ghosts are more <laughs> desperate nowadays, and the storms that rage outside of the cities of the dead can harm even the doughiest silent strider warrior. Excellent choice of words from the uh, from the description there. Al accompanies Thank the Thank you, Cersei Jones, yes. for setting off the nuke, you stupid motherfucker. Absolutely. So the owl accompanies the garrow into the underworld, but a few other traditional totems can do the same. The system for it, this rite takes five minutes to perform. The character must sacrifice a living mammal and touch every character to be affected by the rite with at least a fingerprint of its blood. He then draws the sigil on the ground nearby with the remaining blood. The player should roll intelligence and occult difficulty seven. Success on the rite takes the rite master to the underworld each additional success takes one of the other characters marked in the event that the character does not achieve as many successes as the right has subjects. Those with the highest gnosis go through first. The underworld is a dark and storm tossed realm whose inhabitants feed on the strong emotions of the living. It's very dangerous, but it, but you, if you manage to get through the underworld alive and the silent striders are all about regaining lost wisdom, it would be lethally important, especially in a time of great peril. This is a super important mystic rite. Yeah, go in there, get your info, get out of there. Yep. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip the level 5 one because there's a level 4 one that's arguably far more, uh, far more important, also far more taboo. This is one uh, specific to the camp, Eaters of the Dead. 
the right of dormant wisdom. Mm. So this right is forbidden. Its very existence is denied outside of the tribe, for the silent striders believe that the other Garo would turn on all of them if it were discovered that even one camp among them practiced this ritual. In truth, most striders do not know that it exists or believe that it is only a myth. The right of dormant wisdom is only taught to trusted and experienced members of the Eaters of the Dead camp. The right master and his fellow cultists use the right of dormant wisdom to gain secrets and memories of the dead by ritually devouring the dead person's brain. The ritual will not function properly so long as the brain is intact, regardless of the length of time since the subject's death. Each participant is likely to get a different kind of memory from the subject. One might get their memories of love, or their memories of the voice and sound, or their darkest secrets. The storyteller can vary this thematically based on the participants and the nature of the, ri of the right subject. The worm has its tentacles all over this rite. Cannibalism of any mm. sort is forbidden by the litany. Each use, each use of the right brings a character a step closer to the service of Phobok, the urge worm of fear. The system for it. All those participating in the ritual must engage in the test. Those who succeed gain some small portion of the dead one's memories and secret knowledge. No participant can gain game abilities, knowledges, disciplines, gifts, rights, etc. directly from the use of this ritual. But... At the storyteller's discretion, the right can be used to justify the expenditure of experience points on game abilities that the right subject knew. So, like, if you eat a brain, you can gain XP from that in a, spe in a specific area without having to expand XP. It, it's essentially Diablery. Yes, that's this this <laughs> this right is basically werewolf Diablery. So, as described elsewhere, the worm's touch is on this right. By default, any Garrow who takes part in the Rite of Dormant Wisdom a number of times greater than the Garrow's permanent Gnosis traits will become a slave of Phobok. However, storytellers are encouraged to change this mechanic to make the Garrow's safety zone less predictable to, and, simula, and stimulate roleplay. This ritual will work on the corpses of supernatural creatures such as Garrow and Immortals if the participants expend a permanent point of Gnosis. It will also work on vampires, already corpses, if the vampire is unconscious and immobilized. Using this right on a vampire destroys it. It is forbidden. You can only do this if you're an Eater of the Dead and only a very, very entrusted member of Eaters of the Dead. The knowledge you gain may be invaluable, but the risk of becoming a servant of the Urge Worm is far too great. It is against the litany, and it more than likely will eventually lead to your corruption. Com compare that to the the infamous uh, right caused by the dying cubs. Um, I'm, I'm pulling up what this one is called, but essentially it's the right where you're you torture a human to death. Uh, yeah, pain of the land. You just stab a human to death over and over and over. And you make it a death by a thousand cuts. And when they finally die after a week of stabs, you take their blood and you spill it on some ground and it purifies the area of worm taint. Only for the worm spirits to come back the next day. It's very similar to this, but that red talent right is the lower risk, lower reward version of this. Where if this right goes off, and it goes off right... That is game-changing, like, meta-narrative-changing knowledge that you can learn yes. through doing that ritual. It's lethally important, but it's also lethally dangerous. Yeah, yeah. you are taking a serious gamble, because if you become a servant of a Malgin Incarna, that's a boss fight you just created in that room. Yep. And boss fights are <laughs> deadly in these games. Yes, they are. Well, I wasn't even a boss fight, yeah, I you... almost fucking died. Yeah, you, you still remember the horror of Talib Naveed. Oh, yeah. And lastly, mixing splats. Mixing the books. Yes. Uh, it, it should be obvious what to do with vampire. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Vampires v. werewolves. It, this, this tribe is the boogeyman to, the, to any and all vampire clan. Like, even Zamichi and La Sombra are freaked out by these guys because of just... Well, 
we've said it several times. These guys killed Set. Yes. Let that let that sink in. That's your takeaway from the video. These guys killed Set. Play them. We fought a and... silent strider in our uh, Vampire the Masquerade campaign. I got one shot at the only reason we survived that fight is because our Giovanni, God rest him, managed to capture his soul, and it took four willpower rolls. He almost frenzied. And you didn't kill him after that happened. It just turned him into a wraith. Yes. It, we didn't kill him. <laughs> we just took his soul out of his body. Yeah, you did that, and then you got the hell out of there. Yeah, it, it was it was it was terrifying. If you put if you play if you play vampire, make a silent strider one of your boss fights. And in our ongoing list of werewolves versus vampires, uh, you might want to think that uh, the set height is the obvious choice. Uh, let's not do the obvious choice. Uh, let's not do Ravnos or Banu Hakim either. Let's go a little deeper malkavians if you have a silent strider versus malkavian game you have an awesome cat and mouse game prepared because if that silent strider is following owl specifically and malkavians be malkavians you have two different characters who are seeing into the future who are predicting each other's moves off their future predictions uh, you you haven't seen Future Diary, have you, Kyle? I have not, no. That's a Game of Death anime where it's 12 different people that all have the power of clairvoyance, they can all see the future, who are all trying to kill each other. That's and, uh, that's honestly pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a cool premise. It's not... The, the, the story doesn't go really go that deep with the premise, but the initial concept is so damn cool it carried the whole show. And you can have that. You can have a, a future diary type game with a Silent Strider versus Malkavian type game. Yep. I, I think that's an incredible idea. I, um, as far like, we already know that uh, Wraith and, si and Silent Striders yep. go hand in hand, as we discussed during the, during the lore of everything. So that doesn't really need any more introduction. Um, similar to that, and I. What's up? Mages. What did you have in mind? But yeah, well, you you were saying something. It sounds like it wasn't major related. No, I was th I was I keep thinking about Hunter the Reckoning and like trying to find mm. a and because <laughs> both the IAA and the Silent Striders hate uh, vampires equally. So trying mm. to find trying to you know convince a Silent Strider to talk to an IAA operative. You'd be better, well, more than likely to be a Wayfarer, because wa that's how Wayfarers work. I'd Give me still, some money. Yeah, I think that'd be, that'd be like an interesting hunter, uh, hunter scenario right there. There is a hunter group that would work. The Children of Osiris. Or, well, I can actually do you one better. The Shimsu Haru. But, if you want the events of Mummy in your game, Horus is still alive as a mummy. And he is more than willing to work with the Silent Striders and hunting vampires. That'd be kind of sick, honestly. Like Indiana Jones and the Mummy fighting a fucking fighting fighting the Setites in Egypt. That'd be sick. You meet you meet Horus and he says, "I knew your great 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 grandfather, and therefore you're cool in my book. Let's work together." Yeah, exactly. Mages. Yes. We mentioned before that Isis wasn't exactly a Euthanatos mage, but the Euthanatos, aka the Chakravati, have a lot in common with the Silent Striders, namely when it comes to understanding death. And I can see the Silent Striders being cool with the Euthanatos until the Euthanatos makes a zombie. Uh, then friendship over. You gotta kill that Euthanatos after he does that. Yep. Necromancy yeah, is, a, is a huge no for the uh, for the Silent Striders. They can also have a little bit of um, a, a strange relationship with the Hermetics, given that they don't like the Setites either, but at the same time, these guys made the Tremere, but at the same time, they dis disavowed the Tremere. They say, we have nothing to do with them anymore. But at the same time, it's not they're stopping the Tremere. 
you can have a weird relationship with the Order of Hermes and the Sonic Striders. Yeah. And then um, the Akashic Brotherhood. Uh, get the Akashics to work with you. Uh, have that be a campaign goal. What are the Akashics? Get the, the, the One Punch Men. Oh, yeah. That'd do it. Yeah, they're, they're the guys that have the punch that will deal 20 points of aggravated damage if it connects. What the fuck? <laughs> that's an instant kill against most... Against, I think the only thing that survives that are Nexus Crawlers and Melchin and Karna. That's it. Yeah. And uh, we mentioned it before. Changeling will get get the Slua. The, the Slua are bur uh, burly hunters, and given what these guys were doing when we were talking about camps, I said before that the Slua would be a great friend for the Silent Striders. Uh, temporary if they're unseelie, though, because, you know, unseelie fey tend to be assholes. Yeah, just a little um, bit. There is one other group of fey, the Eshu, the African fairy. And these guys are very similar to Silent Striders. I said before that it's very uncharitable to say that the Silent Striders are copies of the Ravnos. And yet it kind of feels like the SU copied a little bit from the Silent Striders, given how they operate. And they're wanderers who tell stories and uh, kind of similar, but uh, whatever. The, the, the myth existed before White Wolf wrote the story, so I'm not going to say you're copying your own ideas. Yeah. But given how very similar the two groups are, dude, it only makes sense for the two of them to work together. I mean, they don't have to be partners, but have a have a Sonic Strider sit down with an SU and have them tell stories as a scene if you want to do that. Yeah, I think that'd be neat because Silent Striders, always looking for new and old information, love storytelling. And uh, Demon of the Fallen. I mean, it's the Middle East. This is God's chosen people's country. These guys have a, have a teeny tiny settlement in Jerusalem. I mean, it's not it's not Karen's protectorate, but these guys hang around Jerusalem. These guys hang around Medina. These guys hang around Mecca. If you want to bring in some demons, this is a good trap for it. Yes. If you want to, uh, if you want to take your storyteller gloves off and you want to put Lucifer in the game, this is the trap that would do something about it. Yep, and it'd still be a great right. fight. Yeah, you, you you will lose because you you can't fight Lucifer because the guy just doesn't have a health pool. He just wins every fight he goes into. Well, he's you, a deity basically. You didn't watch De Devil Man Cry Baby. We got to do that later. <laughs> I did not. Yeah, yeah no. because th that that might as well just be like Demon the Fall in the anime. Yeah, uh, it's on my to-do list, but then again, I haven't looked at that to-do list in a while. We, we gotta decide which are we gonna watch first, Elf and Lead or Devil May Cry, baby. Oh, you're not making me watch fucking Elf and Lead again. You didn't get it the first time. We gotta try again with you. What is this, a fucking prog rock album? No, I'm not watching yeah, Elf yes. and Lead again. No, <laughs> absolutely fucking lutely not. And with that, we're going to take Kyle off to watch Elf and Lead. That's the end of the episode. Yeah, it's getting late. Uh, next time, what are we doing? We're bringing Ryan back for an episode. Yes. Um, our Ryan... We are going to talk about the fucking weaver food themselves, the Glasswalkers. My tribe. Good night, everybody. Sleep well. Uh, see you then. <laughs>